This is a regular meeting of the South Oak City Council study as the committee of the whole, or in other words, a study session. Um, Ms. Banks, would you take the roll? Thank you. Mr. Fikiasi? No. Mr. Frazier? Here. Uh, Mr. Lian? Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Ms. Eiser? Here. Mr. Here. Ms. Seymour? Uh, she's here out of the room. Okay. Um, Mr. Seiber? Here. And Ms. Jordan? Here. You have six members present. Okay. Uh, this evening, uh, we had a lengthy agenda, and to, uh, because we heard that people were interested in this topic, we've moved from our study room, uh, where we normally have our committee of the whole meeting, to the council chambers to uh, afford uh, people. Um, an opportunity to hear and be in the same room. And um, I'm going to ask that, uh, one, that if you have a cell phone, that you turn it on vibrate or turn it off. And secondly, um, this is council's opportunity to, we're in the middle of a process. And the, and the process goes like this. Someone comes to the city with a proposal for development uh, they would then uh, deal with our or interact with our planning department. Next step in the process, once it's been vetted by the planning department, it goes to the, the uh, city council's uh, site, uh, planning commission. The planning commission then studies the project or the proposal for the length of time that it needs to do that. Uh, and then it makes uh, uh, a recommendation to the full city council. So at this point in the process, uh, city council always comes last. Uh, that's why we have a planning commission. Planning commission vets proposals. And so at this point in the process, this is the council's first opportunity to hear what is proposed with the, with the uh, potential uh, construction of a Walmart store, more so with the rezoning of the property at 12 miles and Southfield. Uh, this evening, um, uh, I think I'd be safe to say that members of this council uh, know less than many of you about this proposed rezoning. In other words, uh, I, and I'll speak for myself, I have just had no communications from Walmart, uh, nor have I um, seen any site plans or proposals. Uh, of course, um, I'm aware that this is in the pipeline, uh, but I have seen nothing, and I don't think uh, there's anybody else at the table that, that, that has also. So um, uh, this uh, is our opportunity to hear the petitioner out, and if you don't agree with what the petitioner says, please I ask that you be respectful and allow them to speak. I, I would ask that you not uh, boo, uh, applaud, uh, or whatever, um, that we have a civil uh, hearing uh, so that the council, one, can learn exactly what it, uh, uh, the uh, petitioner is asking, and secondly, so that we can get our questions uh, asked. Um, having said that, I would add that, one, the uh, council has heard from many of you, and you can continue to uh, let your feelings be known by email, and I believe, Ms. Banks, there's um, there are sheets available with the elected officials' uh, email addresses. There'll also be a, uh, a regular meeting of the council in these chambers next Monday night at 7 p.m. Uh, you can speak under the public participation portion of that meeting. Uh, you need to, if you want to be recognized at that meeting, you need to contact the clerk's office by Wednesday um, of this week. You can also speak at uh, a meeting of the council on January 14th. You would do the same uh, process to contact the city clerk uh, to be heard. And then we are scheduling a public hearing on this rezoning on January 28th. At that time, uh, we will have, uh, when we have a public hearing, if you're not familiar with the process, we open the floor and everyone uh, who wishes to say something uh, about the project uh, may do so. 
Um, I know that this evening, uh, speaking for, again for myself, I have questions for the petitioner based on things that have been written to me in emails or phone calls that I've had from residents. Um, I'm glad that you're here so that I can ask your questions and you can hear answers. And I'm sure that my colleagues have questions that they would like uh, to ask as well. So once again, I ask that uh, we all be respectful and we allow uh, the petitioner to present their case and for the council to be able to hear and ask its questions. And on a final note, I would add that um, over the years um, with the uh, Planning Commission, uh, we appreciate their input on every project that comes along. We read the minutes of the Planning Commission proceedings. Um, many times, uh, things that come up in Planning Commission would come be the same questions that Council would ask. However, having said that, we don't always agree with the Planning Commission. This process is, is completely open, um, and we are, we are, again, here to listen tonight. Um, uh, and not to discredit the Planning Commission at all, we, we're, they really are very helpful to us, but that does not mean that anything it recommends to this body um, is um, uh, agreed upon. Um, before we start off with the presentation, I've asked Mr. Crow, our city planner, if he would give us a, a timeline. There has been uh, some confusion uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'll just, again, speak personally. Um, last December, there was a newspaper article that, that announced that Walmart is coming to 12 and Southfield. We didn't know a thing about it. Mm. Uh, it was in the newspaper, uh, and there was no presentation or, or nothing uh, to counsel. Uh, and there were, uh, clearly, people are having conversations and many times, it's not surprising that this would happen. Uh, when a developer is um, interested in a property, many times they take <coughs> the property owner and put, uh, you know, uh, have a sale agreement that's contingent on zoning. So it, it's, not it's not surprising. However, um, it did take us a, a, a bit by surprise to see it. I believe it was in the uh, Detroit News or it was in the Urban Observer Center. But, um, Mr. Crow, if you would, I'd like to have you give a timeline of um, what has transpired since uh, one year ago this month. Thank you, through the chair. Based on uh, my newspaper clippings, there was an article on December 18, 2011, in the Observer Eccentric newspaper, um, basically saying there's a pending sale for St. Pete's Church with Walmart as an intended buyer. It wasn't until September of 2012 that the planning department actually received an application and at that time the planning department vets it through various city departments including the police department, fire marshal, engineering, our landscape architecture, uh, traffic engineering, our planning department and so forth. On October 3rd, 2012, a preliminary presentation similar to what you're going to get tonight was given to the Planning Commission. By November, we were ready to start bringing forth uh, our initial comments and um, concerns from the departments. And so on November 7th, 2012, the Planning Commission held its first study session. Now, all our public meetings, um, when we go through this process, we send out notices to individuals within 350 feet of the subject property. State law only requires 300, but the city has always tried to go above and beyond the minimum. And because of the sensitivity of this project, we actually doubled our efforts and sent out notices to people within 700 feet of the subject property. And uh, those meetings were open to the public. So our first public study session was on November 7th. We had a second study session on November 14th, and then as many of you know, last Wednesday, November 28th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing, and uh, we'll be um, making a recommendation to City Council. Tonight, December 3rd, 
has always been on the schedule for a preliminary presentation to City Council, and tentatively, uh, we anticipate that um, on January 14th, uh, Council will have their first study session, and around that time, the Council Site Plan Committee would weigh in on the site plan issues, and then tentatively, uh, if all goes well, a public hearing would be scheduled on January 28th. So we're at the stage where the Planning Commission has had study sessions, held their public hearing, and we're at the point where the applicant would like to make a preliminary presentation to City Council. Uh, then, Mr. Kurt, I will uh, thank you for that information. Um, I will then turn the, uh, uh, this item over to you to, for introduction of the uh, petitioner. We have uh, representatives from the, um, the applicant regarding the rezoning proposal as well as um, the site plan. They're going to make one general presentation uh, and then uh, they'll be happy to answer questions that the council may have and I, as city planner, would be happy to make any clarifications that the uh, council may have after the presentation. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Eric for the introductory comments, a slideshow presentation, and if you wouldn't mind, it's Eric, it's up there, if you could introduce your team. Sure. State your name and a business address for the record, please. Council President and Mayor, good evening. My name is Eric Hanks. I'm the Senior Manager of Public Affairs and Government Relations for Walmart. My business address is 208 North Capitol Avenue in Lansing, Michigan. As part of my duties, I have not only local government responsibilities in my two states, both Michigan and Ohio, but I also work with the state legislatures in both states, as well as uh, serve with our Walmart Foundation on behalf of the charitable arm of our corporation as well. With me tonight is Robert Macko from CESO Incorporated and then a host of other uh, very specific members of the team that can answer very specific questions that you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, or excuse me, Council President, and other uh, council members may have. Um, from realty, land use, media, everything across the board. So we're here tonight to give you our overview uh, I'll take about 14 to 15 minutes of your time, if I can, to give you a general overview about Walmart and what we mean not only here in the state of Michigan, but what we, the potential is for your community. And then I'll turn it over to Robert to give you some very detailed specifics on the actual site plan and what we have, uh, what we presented to the Planning Commission and what we're hoping to take before you for a final vote for you and your community. Um, I'll give you just a brief overview. This is our 50th anniversary. Um, the company was founded in 1962 by Mr. Walt. And when he opened the doors of that first store in Rogers, Arkansas, he wanted to serve rural communities that were overlooked by the major retailers at that time. Philosophy was to offer customers the best quality merchandise at the lowest prices. And as I mentioned, 2012 marked our 50th anniversary honoring that tradition. The company was built on a simple foundation, everyday low prices and everyday low costs. We built customer loyalty and trust with that commitment. And our core customers take that commitment seriously. They're working to save money and live better by stretching their budgets and they take that very seriously. There are men and women all over America working hard to save money and build a better life for their families and their communities. Serving these customers by earning their trust will make us stronger as we continue to move forward and we provide real value to a new global generation. Well, why is this important? What's important to us as a company and for your community? Our sustainability continues to make us a better company by doing a multitude of things that help us to pass savings on to our customers. From reduction of waste, lowering costs, driving innovation, and helping us to fill our mission to have our customers save money to live better. The planks of the planet
what does that really mean? In the slide, we see a wind turbine that's erected and now operating out at our distribution center in Red Bluff, California. That one megawatt turbine will generate about 15 to 20 percent of the distribution center's yearly electrical use. That allows us to invest in price and our customers save money. In 2011, as part of our initiative to create zero waste, we reduced plastic bag waste across our global operation by 42 million pounds. That's about 3.1 billion plastic bags that we have moved out of our production. Also in 2011, our truck fleet delivered 65 million more cases while driving 28 million fewer miles. Thanks to that sustainability work, if our truck fleet continued to operate as it did back in 2005, before we began that initiative, it would have cost us an extra half a billion dollars last year alone. By driving towards these sustainability goals, we're saving our company that kind of money that allows us to pass those savings on to our customers. Our sustainability work is also helping us to create jobs locally and in local communities. We've taken a leadership role on sustainable agriculture, and by 2015, we will again double our U.S. sales of locally sourced produce and increase the purchase of our select U.S. Corp, uh, crops. Excuse me. In 2011 alone, we increased the amount of locally sourced produce we sell in the United States by 97%. That accounted for more than 10% of all products sold. And again, our goal by 2015 is to double our U.S. sales of locally sourced produce. Part of that locally sourced program and uh, some of the feedback that we've heard from some of your constituents in our multitude of meetings is what does this mean for them and their lives? Particularly healthy food was described last week when we were here before the Planning Commission and so we thought this video would help to describe a little bit better detail of what was announced in 2011 by our healthier food industry. <coughs>
food, making healthier food more affordable, launching the Great for You icon, increasing charitable support to nutrition programs, and of course addressing food deserts. Our core belief is that customers shouldn't have to choose between food that is good for them and food that they can afford. This is the great view icon that Andrea Thomas, our Senior Vice President of Sustainability, described in the Healthier Food video. It was developed to help our customers instantly identify food offer options that were better for them. It's appearing on a great value brand that you see here and market side items as well as fresh and packaged fruits and vegetables at Walmart stores nationwide. Again, it's one way for us to give our size and scope and input that right here into the local communities and what we're trying to do to help people live better lives. And as the world's largest retailer, we obviously believe we have an opportunity and a responsibility to make a difference on the social and environmental issues that matter most to our customers. The things that matter to our customers, to our associates, and of course the communities that we serve. And we built a model for making a difference Again, we can use our size and scale for positive change through our work in sustainability, hunger, healthy food, and women's empowerment. And here's some of the examples of recent of what we've done. Our focus on giving back to the communities that we operate is reflected in our charitable giving. The video describes specifically the $2 billion commitment that we made to help end hunger in America by providing 1.1 billion pounds of food and over $250 million to hunger relief organizations through 2015. Last year, our food donation program provided more than 338 million pounds of food to local food banks, with the equivalent of 264 million meals. Some of the recent foundation grant awards that were just announced for this fall, Glenish Community Food Bank here in the Southeast Michigan, Forgotten Harvest, Grace Centers of Hope right here in Oakland County, and the Women's Network. So what does Walmart mean to your community for jobs? A job at Walmart is a path to a career.
In many cases, we are exceeding the industry standard for dollars per hour for our hourly employees. 59% of our U.S. workforce is women, and women also make up 29% of our corporate officers. And these are just a few examples of some of the diversity awards that received last year alone. We are the top company for diversity by any number. What does all this mean here in Michigan? We have 82 super centers, 9 discount stores. For those of you that aren't familiar, the discount stores are the original Walmart format that came out. Super centers are a close include the full complement of grocery, which is what we, be, we are proposing here for the city of Southfield. We do have uh, 26 Sam's Clubs and one distribution center. And that total here in the state of Michigan is just over 32,000 employees here for the Walmart family. In this current year, we've contributed $4.2 billion for merchandise and services with over 1,200 suppliers in Michigan, resulting in just over 62,000 supplier jobs as a result of our economic impact. And what does that again that mean here for in the city of Southfield? We have seven suppliers located right here in the city of Southfield. From large corporations that do advertising to, I found it ironic, a smaller group that actually works with us for a dairy spread that they utilize as part of their service and their jobs that they provide. So seven suppliers right here in Southfield. The stores proposed is estimated to generate $316 million of new tax revenue. That's real property tax revenue in the city of Southfield. And as you all are familiar, that revenue formula translates to roughly one third of that or around $100 million of general fund revenue for the city of Southfield. I'm sorry, $130,000. $350,000. Three hundred. I'm sorry. Three hundred and the. Let me go back. Just to make sure we got this clear. Two hundred and thirty-six million in total state taxes. Ninety-six million in state and local taxes. And the tax rate here for the city of Southland is three hundred and sixteen thousand. Three hundred and sixteen thousand dollars of real property. The formula one third of that would generate roughly a hundred thousand dollars for the general fund here in the city of Southland. And so it's elected officials. You're going to have to weigh the facts that we're presenting, site plan information that Robert and his team will be presenting, and of course some of the fiction that goes along with a big company like Walmart that comes to town. We hope you have a balanced approach to the vocal opposition that you will see, and that you consider that not only the thousands of customers we hope to serve, but the benefit that your community will receive from our proposal. So what I have here is something that will, in some cases, may shock you, in other cases may give you some pause, but in other cases may show you exactly what other elected officials that have been seated in bodies like these that have had to make these decisions have had to do. The
small federal division known as Rosie, which would cease to exist.
be a week before you be willing to sit and listen and look at what I have to present? You are out of order right now? Yes, I am. We are in a council I'm just presentation that out from the petitioner. Yep. I'm just putting um, that out there. Please state your name and business address for the record. Yes, Robert Manco, CESO 8164 Executive Court Drive in Lansing, Michigan. Mayor, Chairman, Council Members, I'm here before you this evening to uh, just go over the rezoning request and walk you through the site plan and at that point turn it over to Mr. Chris Bershears, the architect for the project, and he will go through the building elevations for the project. And uh, thank you again for your time tonight. <coughs> the rezoning request before you, this shows the existing zoning. Um, what you're looking at in yellow is the existing St. B Church site. Uh, it's just shy of 10 acres in size, and it is currently zoned uh, single family residential. There is a small pocket to the north that uh, is zoned office space, and then uh, north of there uh, is zoned, currently zoned B2, which is planned business. Um, in addition, off to the uh, southwest corner, over in this area, this is the uh, Southfield uh, Church, or sorry, the Southfield Funeral Home property, and uh, that is going to be a separate rezoning request. But there, there is a portion of the Southfield Funeral Home that is uh, currently zoned um, office space, and then you can see just south of Kesh, a portion that is uh, zoned vehicular parking. You can see Kesh Street in this area. And then to the north, this portion is residential. Uh, there is a small little piece of the Walmart parcel um, that would be uh, zoned, rezoned for parking as well. So again, uh, this just shows the existing zoning for, for the site. And in all, the total was approximately 13 acres. The proposed zoning for the site, we would look at rezoning the uh, what we call the Walmart parcel to B3 general business that would support uh, a store such as a Walmart development. Um, going over here to the funeral home property, uh, this portion here, including Cash Street, would be rezoned to vehicular parking. The uh, existing zoning to the south for the funeral home would remain as office space. This uh, slide just shows current conditions around uh, St. Pete's Church. Um, you can see here uh, each picture corresponds to the view. Um, you can see now uh, the existing parking lot. There is some grass growing up through the parking lot. Um, there are some, some curb and gutter and parking blocks uh, that are in some, some uh, little, little bad shape there. We also have, uh, again, some other views uh, behind the church as well. And again, the Orient View North is actually to the right. Uh, so this would be Southfield Road, and this is 12 Mile Road. This slide here just shows the uh, what actually this project will encompass in terms of demolition and what buildings would remain. The blue buildings you see are buildings that would be demolished uh, to actually facilitate the construction of the Walmart development. Uh, this area here is the St. Bede's Church. This area right in here is the, the part of the existing uh, strip retail uh, that is located, uh, again, just north of St. Bede Church. North, again, is to the right, just orienting you. This is Southfield Road, and this is 12 Mile Road. And again, the strip uh, to the north, this area would be demolished. It currently contains an Einstein bagels, uh, a watch place, and a, there's a few other um, empty areas now. The area to the north, shown in red, is the existing strip center. There was an old Kenzie restaurant, I believe, that is vacated at this point in this area. Uh, that portion would remain and is not part of this project. You can see over here, this is the Southfield Funeral Home area, the building and the now building. This uh, slide also shows that there are five existing access points three along Southfield Road and two along 12 Mile Road that will be closed or removed as part of this project. And again, you can kind of see those 
The um, area up here, this portion, it will be removed. Um, later on, you'll see with the site plan, we're actually looking at combining the existing funeral home driveway with the, uh, the only Walmart access off of uh, 12 Mount Road. This here shows the site plan. This is the drive up here I was talking about. This drive would be a right in, right out, left in, with the left out movement prohibited. And that is the only access point off of 12 Mile Road. And then again, it is a shared access with the Southfield Funeral Home. Um, in addition, uh, Southfield Funeral Home would have two access points to the Walmart development. And uh, there are cross access parking agreements place between the Southfield Funeral Home, Walmart, and also the Strip Center to the north. You can see here again uh, the left out prohibited. We're also showing, and this uh, came up through Planning Commission, and we went back and, and looked at the request and the concerns with Guy Street, and we ended up making this a left out and a right in only. Moving along to Southfield Road, we are lining up at Edwards Avenue with our three lane cross section approach, and that will tie directly into the existing signal at Edwards. So, again, all these access points along Southfield Road would be removed, and again, along 12 Mile Road, with the, uh, with the westernmost being a shared driveway with the funeral home. What this uh, does is this creates for this site the, the best possible access scenario that you can have. The access driveways are as far from the intersection of 12 <coughs> Mile and South Hill Road as the property would permit. And again, we're looking at a shared driveway and also another driveway that aligns with Edwards where an existing signal does exist. This site plan also shows proposed new sidewalk all along 12 Mile Road. And that would be a widened sidewalk that would allow pedestrian and bicycle movements eight feet in width as well as new sidewalk up along Southfield Road. And you can see here we actually have connections to the storefront. Uh, we're also looking at uh, new smart bus shelters in both on Southfield Road and on 12 Mile Road. Uh, a lot of these island areas in the parking lot will be landscaped. And also, we'll get to the slide later, but this area here will uh, contain an eight foot high berm with eight foot tall staggered evergreens on top of the berm, somewhat shielding the back of the Walmart store. This here shows the truck area, and that will actually be a truck well. So the trucks will actually go down about three and a half to four feet into the well. There is a wall approximately 16 feet in height, and uh, Mr. Brashears will go over that a little bit further in detail. We're also showing sidewalk up along the eastern boundary of the Southfield Funeral Home, as well as sidewalk from Guy Street that connects to the front of the store. Uh, we also took uh, some of the Planning Commission members' uh, advice, and, and we are showing uh, a connection from the Strip Center to the north. Uh, detention for the site, stormwater, there was some concern over. Stormwater for the site will be underground. It will uh, meet not only the state's um, requirements, but also the county's requirements for stormwater detained. Uh, the site will be fully um, you know, contained inlets, catch basins that would pick up any stormwater and again would store it underground and discharge at the appropriate rate. This shows uh, the Southfield Funeral Home, just more of a blow up area. This is the um, sidewalk along the western property line, or I'm sorry, eastern property line of the funeral home, western property line of Walmart. Uh, you can see here the, the left out and right in movement. This driveway was also shifted further to the north. The existing driveway is right here, and we would close that driveway, extend the sidewalk, and move the approach uh, approximately 75 to 80 feet further north. And again, that is to get a little bit more from the uh, south, our 12 mile road intersection. Parking summary. Um, all parking spaces on the site are nine feet wide by 20 feet deep. Again, as indicated earlier, cross parking agreements will be provided between Walmart, the funeral home, and the remaining strip center. The city requirement is a one per 150 usable floor area. That's a parking ratio. Walmart typically throughout the state um, has looked at a one per 200
150 usable floor area parking ratio. But essentially adding up all, all of the different developments, the strip center, the funeral home, and the Walmart development, uh, we're looking at a uh, overall parking that is within 74, 72 to 74 parking spaces. I believe there's a couple of parking spaces that, that were decreased due to the uh, bicycle uh, component of bicycle parking. So we're between 72 to 74 spaces uh, uh, within what is required by code. It should also be noted that uh, that this count does not or does not reflect a 91 parking space waiver that was granted, uh, I believe, over 10 years ago for the strip center to the north. So we would be requesting a 74 parking space waiver. The overall, you can see here, proposed, we're looking at 921 spaces and 995 are proposed. Again, it should also be noted that uh, the green space for this site, and we have a slide here a little bit later, we far exceed the city's requirements, uh, specifically not only in the berm area, but throughout the internal portions of the parking lot. We feel that, uh, that it, uh, it more than meets the requirements not only of Walmart, uh, we do have cross parking with a funeral home, but in addition, uh, we're, we're trying to create as much green space on the site as possible, um, and, and specifically with the berm area to the rear, uh, we feel that's an important component of the site. This is what I was talking about, the uh, required, we're looking at 15,075 square feet of green space. Uh, we're providing over 22,270 square feet of green space. So we're, we're in excess of over 7,195 square feet. You can see this large green space area here is very similar to what uh, the Utah Depot has in front. Uh, not required by the Road Commission, but Walmart is going to be dedicating that area uh, to the county for future uh, roadway improvements along Southfield Road. It's approximately, I believe, 60 feet additional right away in width. That is the reason for the sidewalk being placed where it is. We're also on this uh, plan, we're showing a nice uh, decorative feature at the intersection of Southfield and 12 Mile Road. We do have some slides later on that show and detail that area, but it creates a, a nice seating area and kind of really spruces up the uh, northwest corner of that intersection. Again, here we're just showing the different types of plantings, uh, additional plantings along the western property line, as well as there will be an eight-foot wall that will start, I'm sorry, start from up here and extend south to this point and then west along the north property line of the funeral home. And again, the code requires, uh, city code only requires six feet, but we are proposing an eight foot wall. Mm. Uh, there is an existing wall there, but it would be demolished. I believe if any of you have been out there, it's kind of a white brick. Um, it's, it's kind of in poor shape right now, so we would look at a complete removal and replacement of that wall. And again, we'd be looking at an eight feet in height. That would again extend along the north property line also of the funeral home. Traffic summary. Uh, I do understand traffic is a, a concern for this site. Uh, Walmart, again, does intend to demolish the existing church, um, an associated school, and uh, the, the strip retail building to the north. The proposed Walmart is 130,124 square feet. It would contain both the grocery and the retail component. Just to put it in perspective, the existing Home Depot and Target stores are just shy of 130,000 square feet. They're in the 127 to 129,000 square foot range. Site access, I've discussed about five existing full access driveways being closed. Um, I did talk about the access to the Walmart development. Again, we tried to create the best possible access scenario to this site, keeping in mind uh, the intersection of 12 Mile and South Hill Road is a busy intersection. We did conduct, uh, conduct, and some of you may have seen four or five months ago, tubes out on uh, 12 Mile and Southfield Road intersection. 24 hour counts were conducted. The current ADT on Southfield Road is, is just shy of 50,000 vehicles per day, and on 12 Mile Road it is right around the 20,000 vehicles per day. <coughs> the traffic study conclusion 
indicated that, again, the Southfield Road and 12 Mile Road uh, currently operates as well service E condition during the weekday PM peak hour, peak hour time periods. Um, all other key study intersections, uh, including the drive we're connecting into at Edwards, would operate at level service B as in boy level service condition. The eastbound and northbound left turn movements at Southfield Road and 12 Mile Road intersection, they do operate at level service F condition during certain time frames of the day. Um, under the background 2014 traffic scenario, that would be everything without the development of the Walmart. Uh, the 12 mile and South Road, Road intersection will continue to operate at level service E condition. Again, that's without construction of the Walmart. The net new trips that the Walmart would generate are inbound 93 during the AM peak hour, outbound 72 trips, and then we have 52 pass by trips. And a pass by trip is essentially a trip that is not destined for the Walmart development, but is simply passing by the site and decides to stop by. Um, you can see during the midday it does increase, and then during the PM it's similar to the midday conditions. Walmart generated traffic will contribute as a, as a whole less than a 5% increase in traffic at the 12 mile road and South Hill Road intersection. Um, Walmart, again, will produce very similar traffic volumes as seen at the nearby Target and Home Depot stores. Um, it should also be noted that the eastbound and northbound left turn movement uh, does back up uh, during uh, PM peak hours specifically, and uh, the Walmart development will actually contribute zero volume to that movement. Uh, we are showing those trips as entering the 12 mile road driveway. Again, exiting the site, uh, right southbound to westbound right turn volumes would actually use the 12 mile road intersection as well. And uh, that is the reason that there, there are less trips um, entering the Southfield and 12 mile road intersection. Uh, based on the results of the analysis, the Walmart development with improvements, which I will get to in the next slide, will not increase the overall delay at the key study intersections. And what that means is we are going to be mitigating any impact that the Walmart development will have on that intersection. Specifically, we will, uh, and again, regardless of the proposed Walmart development, you know, many of these recommended improvements are needed today at the intersection. Uh, Walmart, please note that Walmart would be paying for these improvements as part of this project, but specifically on 12 Mile Road, again, we talked about removing two existing full access driveways. Um, on 12 Mile Road at the Walmart driveway, we'd be looking at that access as a right in, right out, left in driveway, so the left out would be prohibited. We would also be constructing or extending the westbound to northbound uh, turn lane on 12 Mile Road. We'd also uh, be combining the existing funeral home driveway and Walmart driveway. On South Hill Road, we would be removing the existing three full access driveways and would be dedicating its 42 feet of Walmart property for future county right of way. Southfield Road and 12 Mile Road, we would be entirely removing and replacing the existing traffic signal and retiming to include right turn overlaps in all directions. And uh, we'll show here in a, a later slide, but uh, the existing signal at that location is a simple or diagonal span signal with two poles. We'd be looking at going with a, uh, a full mask arm more of a, a box type of arrangement, which uh, again would make for a much safer intersection. Uh, currently MDOT is actually under initiative to replace all of their simple or diagonal span traffic signals in the state. Um, so you'll see uh, any signal modification even done by MDOT, they're going to a four pole uh, system. Uh, Southfield Road and Edwards Avenue, again, we would also be replacing the existing signal there and also constructing a mast arm traffic signal. Um, all of these signal um, improvements would also include removal and replacement of all the video detection that's currently there, as well as controllers, uh, it's essentially modernizing the entire intersections. We'd also be constructing a three-lane driveway uh, servicing both the Walmart and remaining shopping center development. Uh, that three-lane driveway is important because it will get vehicles out of the turn lanes and would stop any queuing into uh, Southfield Road. You can see here, uh, this is what I was referring to about a simple or diagonal span signal. This is what currently exists. This currently just 
shows the, the southbound right turn queue length that would be experienced now. It's 187 feet. Uh, this was based on a uh, plan commission member's request or concerns about the southbound right. Um, what we'd be doing is with the right turn overlap is whenever these left turn phases would actually go, uh, these two lefts, the southbound right and northbound right would concurrently uh, move and, or, or the phase would actually go on. Right now we have no, turn, no right turn on reds at the location. You can see here this uh, this improvement here, this right turn lane will extend all the way back to our 12 mile road intersection. This just shows a typical box span signal. Now again, what we're going to be doing is mast arms. So we're going to have the mast arms are going to come kind of come out from the poles in each corner. You can see it's really going to spread out the signals a lot better. It is going to make it a much safer intersection. Uh, we have presented the report to the road commission as well as the city staff. Uh, the road commission does support the findings and methodology of the traffic impact study. Uh, that meeting was had or conducted with the road commission um, in access of over a month ago. And this just shows a picture of what the current intersection looks like with a simple diagonal span traffic signal. This is what would be proposed. Uh, you can see an ornamental decorative uh, would have uh, the, the luminaire also the mast arm with the signals and this actually here would be an illuminated street sign just calling out where uh, either 12 mile or south road would be located. Mm. Parking lot lighting, this was also some concern early on. Walmart intends to go with LED lighting for this site. You can see here uh, what, what happens is with the more traditional lighting uh, you will get some spillover, some spillover effect, or it will be uh, maybe not quite as illuminated on site, but the parking lot lighting for the Walmart would be downward directed and would have zero foot candle spillage over the property lines. You can see here, this is a, a, a picture of the LED lighting. This is actually a picture on the other side of this wall. It would be a very similar scenario to what we'd be looking at here in Southfield. And you can see here on the other side, unless you're looking directly at the store, there is zero spillover uh, onto the adjacent properties. This just uh, is a comparison. There were some questions asked earlier about what type of other sites would this one even compare it with. Uh, this is a site right now, and uh, it's an existing Walmart in Roseville. Uh, the current site is approximately 10.14 acres. The building size is 135,000 square feet. Right now, that store does not contain the grocery component, but was recently just approved for expansion to 177,789 square feet with an 11.57 acre site. Now, there is a little bit more parking, but there's obviously much less green space on that site. The 135,000 square foot uh, is very similar to what we are proposing. Uh, Gratiot Avenue and uh, 12 Mile Road are very similar, if not more, uh, higher volume roadways than what we might have here at Southfield and 12 Mile Road. You can see here we do a, a butt up against residential <coughs> property. So this was a, a fairly good example of a, of a site that, that's somewhat similar to what we'd be looking at here. <coughs> This just shows the proposed expansion area that was approved. You can see the residential area right along the rear of the store and also along the uh, eastern side of the store. Again, other stores uh, you know, that, that actually abut up against or near residential areas, these are just a few, but there are um, many other slides I could show you as well. But this one here is the Chesterfield. You can see here, Walmart is abutting right up against uh, Noble Drive. And then here on uh, Telegraph Road in Taylor, you can see here the side of the Walmart abuts up against residential neighborhoods. And uh, what we'd like to point out here is that neither of these sites, since uh, <coughs> constructed and opened, have had any complaints about the residential uh, neighborhoods, have had no complaints right. to the jurisdictions about how Walmart has uh, operated as a neighborhood. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Christopher Shears, and he will walk you through the architectural portion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. If you could state your name and, and business address for the record. Yes, uh, my name is Chris Shears. I'm with CESO. Uh, my address is 1305 North East McLean Road in Bentonville, Arkansas. Um, this store provides, uh, Walmart 
elevations being exposed to uh, public views. Uh, Walmart decided to upgrade uh, not just the front, but uh, additional elements along the sides of the rear. Um, kind of the start, the main building walls will be a uh, wood brick material, it's this red material here. Uh, instead of typically they do a painted material that requires maintenance, this one they've, they've upgraded to angular colored materials uh, to provide a nicer look. It's a, it's a, uh, helps break up the mass of it and provides a more variation in texture and color. Um, this side would be the side facing the parking lot. Uh, there's been additional windows added. Uh, these are spandrel glass windows uh, that were added to provide a more pedestrian uh, friendly uh, look along the front so uh, people accessing them from uh, both the parking lot and the, the sidewalks from uh, the neighborhood. Uh, they've also added uh, canopies and some different materials along the front to break up the, both the uh, vertical plane and the horizontal plane uh, rather than just having a, a, a big box like a lot of the uh, stores, uh, big box stores historically have had. Um, if you go around the building to this elevation, is the elevation that faces uh, Southfield Road. We've continued those elements uh, along that side of the road. We feel that that uh, we want to continue that pedestrian look uh, with the sidewalk and the, and the plantings that we showed earlier, uh, with the additional windows, the difference in materials, of a couple of different colors of the quick brick and some uh, CMU along this side. Um, the side facing the funeral home is Right here, it includes the garden center, which will have an ornamental fence area for both the uh, light plant area and for the high area. We've added ornamental fence to be similar to what kind of the Home Depot has uh, in their garden center area. Um, and then along the rear, which majority of the rear will be screened by the berm, uh, but we've, we've still added elements to uh, break up the back uh, to provide some interest uh, for any views that might be uh, visible from our entrance uh, over off 12 Mile Road. This kind of gives you an idea of the makeup of, of this store. Uh, the grocery sales uh, in this store is larger than a typical store of size. Uh, Walmart has decided that's something that uh, this location uh, needs a bigger uh, concentration of. Uh, so they've reduced the general merchandise and added more grocery sales. Uh, the stock room and office kind of service areas are more located towards the rear, towards 12 Mile. Uh, as far away from the uh, residential areas we could get them uh, for the site so that there's minimal impact for those service type areas uh, along the side. And then this area here is the uh, garden center uh, along with the high rack area uh, to enclose all the, all the garden center items and uh, keep them nice, nicely enclosed within that area. Uh, signage. Uh, we had a, some neighborhood meetings uh, and there was some concern about a, a large sign like this uh, being viewed from the residential area. So the sign we would be proposing on 12 Mile Road uh, was reduced in height from 20 foot to 7 foot uh, so that it would be visible from the neighborhoods over there. Uh, and then we will also have another sign up along um, Southfield Road at the, at the uh, stoplight. kind of give you just a perspective view and you can kind of see some of the uh, changes in height and vertical and horizontal uh, changes along the front so that it kind of illustrates that there's some lower roofs, some high different elements that help break that up and, and make it not seem uh, like a typical big box store. Uh, we've also added in this area right here a seating area so anyone waiting for transportation or, or needing their uh, walking a distance. There's some benches, some landscaping in that area uh, away from the entrance so it's out of kind of the vehicular uh, busyness of uh, the entry area. This top elevation is headed uh, southbound on Southfield Road. Uh, we've added a decorative short fence with columns and uh, ornamental trees along uh, this side to provide a nice streetscape along that side. Uh, and then you know, as, as a background we have the uh, updated elevations. Uh, the trees continue up to uh, majority of the end and then at the uh, next slide I'll show you a little bit. We've changed to evergreens to help screen uh, the back service areas so that they are not visible uh, from Southfield Road. And then this is the element that we talked about earlier a little bit uh, for the corner with some benches, nice fence and plantings uh, to provide a nice uh, a gateway right there. 
This bottom one is just another view of that back. We've added the other pieces to kind of screen that direct view uh, along the back of the store. This is the wall that we would be constructing to replace the existing wall, the eight foot wall that uh, we'll be replacing the kind of uh, uh, rough shape wall that is currently there. And that's kind of what we have. I also have a material board I'll, I'll pass around so you can kind of get an idea of some of the, the materials we've upgraded for this. And uh, our whole team is here to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Thank you. Um, once again, I want to state that um, this is not a public hearing. This is council's opportunity to hear from Walmart, Walmart which is uh, our first time, and council's uh, opportunity to um, ask questions. Um, Mr. Crow, is there anything that uh, you uh, need to or wish to add at this time? Not at this time, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, um, we, uh, if you are interested, uh, once again, if you are interested in communicating with council um, with questions, uh, you have three opportunities to speak on the 14th of December, or rather the uh, 10th of December, of the 14th of January in the public hearing on January 28th. Uh, you will also may email any of your elected officials uh, with your opinions, your questions, um, your comments, your concerns. Uh, also tonight, uh, up in front, we have uh, three by five cards. If you wish, uh, you can put your name uh, and contact information on the card and um, whether you're opposed or supportive, your question, concern, comment, whatever you wish to communicate. These will be uh, replicated and shared with the entire council if um, uh, you do not uh, either have access to email or don't wish to email us. But that uh, we want to provide an opportunity to hear from you. But it's really, really important, and I'm going to say it again, that uh, council has an opportunity to ask its questions. And I uh, want to underscore, yes, we live in a free country, but that does not mean that we have a free-for-all in this chamber. We are going to have a civil um, uh, discourse where we will recess this meeting. I'm an old school teacher, and I wouldn't allow it in my classroom. I'm not going to allow it here. We want to hear from Walmart. So uh, with that, I will entertain... Um, Questions uh, from council or comments? Yeah. And Mr. Moss? Thank you. Uh, I guess I will start off with my immediate reaction to the piece of the presentation, um, just for the benefit of the residents in the room. I would change something when going from uh, community to community. And in the video with the city council portion, it seemed to demonize the residents. And I don't think we should demonize the people who oppose this project. Uh, especially, you know, coming from a Southfield perspective, I've grown up here all my life, we're not going to be rowdy, we're not going to be uh, out of control, as Councilman Cyber said. Uh, you know, I think the residents, they reminded me of when it was the health care debate on the federal level, the, the mob mentality. I think that we're going to be respectful of this process. And for the people who have, you know, screamed out, maybe one or two of you, there are about three times as many groans in the room. We don't want to hear the groaning. We just want to hear the presentation and provide everyone the opportunity to speak when appropriate and have uh, the cards uh, come back to council. And there's so many opportunities to weigh in. But as Councilman Cyber said, if you attended the hearing on Wednesday night, you know, you know, you knew more walking into this room than we did. We wanted to stay out of that process to make sure it was. I kept, I wanted to keep an open mind. Um, because uh, it's important, this is going to be probably the toughest and most important vote I'm going to take. Um, so I didn't want to be colluded by anything that, that was rumor, innuendo. I wanted to hear it for myself and hear the facts for myself. So I know the residents have been emailing us, and that's important to the process. Uh, I've, I've tried my very best to respond to each and every one that's come forward. I see Nancy Smith is in the audience right before I uh, came here. I saw your email, so I owe you a response. But that's another way of contacting us as well. Um, and uh, on the onset, I think there needs to be a very clear uh, expectation from the residents and a very clear uh, communication from the council. What are we even voting on here? We know there's a Walmart. We know there's a church property. What are we as a council officially doing 
here in this meeting when we take a yes vote or we take a no vote. Uh, and I don't know if the planner wants to address that further or it's or legal. What is the exact proposal that's coming? It, you know, it's, it's been very simplistically put is we're voting yes for Walmart and we're voting no for Walmart. That's not the case. What exactly are we voting on here? Through the chair? Uh, there's a, it's a two-step process. The first consideration is whether or not the council believes rezoning from the existing RA single family residential OS office service and B2 plant um, business to B3 general business. And that includes all of the potential uses that it's currently allowed in the B3 business as well as special uses. That in itself does not guarantee that Walmart would come forward. So the first and the most important step is the rezoning. And the council will be asked to consider whether or not uh, it should remain existing single family office in B2, or whether or not council should consider B3 general business and all of the permitted uses in the B3 business. If that is done, then the council will uh, also be asked to consider site plan issues with regards to the proposed Walmart. It doesn't, again, guarantee that what's being presented would be approved because of the size of the site, traffic, circulation, density, use, and so forth. But that's a separate process that the council would be voting on, is the specifics of what's being proposed on the site plan. So two, two, two things, the rezoning of the Walmart parcel itself, and then uh, if it gets rezoned to B3, whether or not the proposed site plan meets the requirements of the ordinance. So we're voting on appropriate land use for the area. I, first, I, I assume that Walmart probably has a contingency sale if it doesn't go through. You know, I don't think Walmart just wants to own a church. So we, we are voting on, on what a private enterprise, the Archdiocese, it, we are not voting on what the Archdiocese is doing in their private sales whatsoever. You know, that they have the, 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 the right to sell the land, whomever that they want to, and it will stay zoned as possible until council takes a vote. So I, I'll just say to the emails that, that we've received, and, and it, there, there are numerous other suggestions for this property. Uh, I've seen, you know, Whole Foods, I've seen uh, some other type of developments, uh, Trader Joe's, Bistro Eateries, Bakery. We don't control that necessarily by how we vote because that's not the proposal that if it all goes forward. Uh, that, that's basically correct. If the council wants to keep it residential, then only residential or religious institutions would be allowed. If the council um, deems it in the best interest of the city to amend it to a business, then all of those potential businesses that you discussed could be allowed, but they would have to go through a site plan process. So there's, we're not voting on picking and choosing what moves in, we're voting on the land usage. So I, I know that there was confusion, I, I've received several emails of other suggested properties that could have gone there, that's not what we're voting on. Uh, so, I, I want to talk just, uh, I, I pro my colleagues will probably touch upon, you know, what we're here to advocate for on behalf of the residents. Uh, we want to, uh, we all want to maintain the serenity of the neighborhood, uh, and we can be your advocates for that. Uh, we all want to uh, ensure that the traffic of South Hill Road and 12 Mile Road does not impede the quality of life in the city of South Hill, and we can be your advocates for that. Uh, but uh, what is my concern is, you know, I've received so many emails on the labor practices of Walmart, on, on you know, with these macro level issues on micro level projects. So I want to, I do want to start off by addressing that first, so it's clear, you know, what are some of the concerns about the idea of a Walmart, so then we can get dig into the parts that are, are of a greater concern that we can actually control, traffic, serenity of the neighborhood. So I'll start off by saying I have been to a Walmart once in my entire life. Uh, I uh, was doing uh, Hurricane Katrina relief work in the Gulf Coast, and it was we were staying in kind of a tense city, and uh, it was much colder than we anticipated. This was during college. And the only place to get sweatshirts and sweatpants, because it was really cold overnight, was the Walmart in Kiln, Mississippi. So my exposure to Walmart is the one time, probably seven years ago, that I went to Kiln, Mississippi. In 
Instead, what I hear about Walmart and what I'm exposed to is what I see from what I read on Facebook, especially if it's uh, Black Friday. You know, there a lot, there's a lot of flurry of activity on Black Friday uh, you know, on Facebook. What I'm hearing from the residents, uh, I, I printed out, this is literally my Facebook news feed from uh, Black Friday, 13 pages all on Walmart. Uh, so there's, there's a discrepancy between what you read on the internet and sometimes the truth. And we all know that. Chain emails kind of get us all riled up. My aunt is one of those people who will send me emails and it has no basis in truth in it. But, but, but there, is a, there, there is a discrepancy here. You know, we have Walmart saying to us that an average wage is $12.60 an hour, and I receive emails from two different residents, one site that is $10.11, another site that is $8.81, and both had footnotes to a website. So one of those numbers is right, and two of those numbers are wrong. So I, I just want, I, you know, this is not Walmart's first time coming into a community. I'm certain you have the talking points down. but. I need some sense of why is there such a, a, a backlash against the business practices of Walmart? What is some of the reality that you can give us grounded in fact? And what's the, what's, what do you think is the cause for that discrepancy? Because before we get to the hard things that we can deal with on council, I want to address those first because that's the reputation I see of Walmart. I, I read what's on the internet, you know, but I don't take it all with its fact, but it's still out there. So I don't know if that, that's directed to someone from uh, the Walmart representative. I, I'm sure you have something prepared because you knew that that, that question was coming up. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 I would address that to Mr. King. <coughs> I want to speak to you about the facts. 
may not be the greatest job for them, but it might be the only job that's available to them at that moment. Another individual, like our store manager and Taylor, who started at the high school level with his first job at Walmart, and now has worked up through the ranks, made Walmart, he chose to make Walmart a career, and now is the store manager of that store in Taylor. I think if you were to ask that store manager his experience at Walmart, he would tell you it's a fantastic experience. You mentioned earlier the, the issues on, you know, on Black Friday and all of the scuttle and all of the Facebook and all of the media reports on potential walkouts and strikes and individuals associated with our company that left their obligations as employees and chose to participate. 1.4 million employees less than 100 actual associates in this country participated. And one, one in Michigan. Everybody else that you saw, all the other media reports, were outside interests that were trying to get in. They have their own reasons for that, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you why they are doing those things. You can come up with your own conclusions. It's pure speculation on my part. What I can tell you again are the facts. Again, described in what our business director for the West BU put in the San Francisco Chronicle on that as well just this weekend. Less than 100, one employee in the state of Michigan actually participated. Everybody else that you saw was an outside related sympathizer, union member, whatever it may be. Okay. Um, Mr. Jordan, I have a question too. Like just one um, question. Um, I have a question later. In your class presentation, you said that you have 300. Thousand full-time employees, and their average wage is twelve dollars and sixty-one cents. But then you have one point four million employees. So I'm seeing a gap in terms of what those employees. What's the average salary of those employees? Yeah, and that's, I'm glad you answered that, Councilwoman. I apologize if there's confusion. So let me go back and hopefully clarify that for you. What you see on on slide twelve of the presentation that we did is one point. We have one point four million employees here in the U.S. I believe the three hundred thousand number that you're referring to is we have three hundred thousand employees of that one point four million. Those three hundred thousand associates have worked for Walmart <coughs> for over ten years. And because in mul a multitude of roles, they could be in a store. If they could have at this point moved up through the ranks of working in the store, be an associate at the home office in Bentonville, be at one of the regional offices, they're across the board. And their average salary is. I, I do not have. I'm, just, I'm sorry for management and salaried employees. I do not have those numbers. So where did the twelve dollars and sixty? That that number of twelve dollars and sixty one cents is based on hourly employees here in the state of Michigan. So myself as a salaried employee is not counted in that number. As I mentioned, with councilman law skewing the average age of the council, my salary does not skew that number. The store manager's salary does not skew that number. That number is for full time hourly employees here in Michigan. And again, you can see it's pretty. It fluctuates, of course, by state by state. But that information is all public. Mr. Mark. Yeah. So again, these are our macro little issues for a micro level project. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's important that, it, it, it's on my mind in this project, but again, I think our charge here is on land use, serenity of the neighborhood, and traffic. From what I've heard that has come out of the planning commission meeting, so I want to get down to the nitty gritty, the, the planning commission, uh, a lot of uh, attention was drawn to the fact that perhaps we would want a Walmart in Southville, but not at this location. Can we talk about why it's not at another location? I, I think maybe that's a question for the planner. <coughs> I, I think it would be a better question for them to answer, other than this. The, the Archdiocese of Detroit is a willing seller, and Walmart's interested in that site. And there's marketing reasons why they're interested in that site. I've been told they may be interested in an additional site, but they are interested in this site. And we don't control or dictate that. We just process it. So we're only processing this site because that's what the application has been submitted. 
Um, I'll, I'll defer to the representative of Walmart to talk about marketing and why, as I've heard, why Northland Mall may or may not be suitable or 8 Mile may or may not be suitable. Because I think I've heard that question come up myself. And before you speak, may I uh, just interject here that our planner's job is to receive the proposals and to vet them and work with potential developers. Um, his job is not to, oh, you need to build something here, build something here. Um, he, he is the person, uh, so he's sort of a messenger. Um, <coughs> and and you know, it goes with the territory, being the planner. He, he gets uh, blamed for things. But uh, what he has done is done his job. He, he's put uh, the, the representatives on this project and every other project through the process so that they get heard. Um, the buck rests right at this table. So um, you may uh, proceed with your answer, but I, I, I want to be clear. Um, the, the planner is doing what he's hired to do for this project or any other that comes along in the city of Southfield. Well, in addition to, the, of course, the planning commission process, we as a company reached out to and had four separate public meetings first one was the notice was posted uh, right on the Friday before, frankly, the Labor Day weekend. And as residents turned out for that first meeting, we were informed that some of those residents literally did not receive the notice until that very day. That's right. So what we chose to do, again, under no obligation to the city or to the residents to do this, was to reissue those notices and hold a second meeting. Both of those basically correlated with the same 350-foot rule that you all utilize as part of your statute when you're notifying your residents. After we held those two meetings, we then expanded out the circle a bit and invited some very specific neighborhood associations in the community in addition to those that they already have. So we had four separate meetings at the, the, uh, at the church to talk to residents about the project, to show them, as you all mentioned, the slides that you saw, the presentation, what we were proposing to take before a planning commission and inevitably we hoped for city council for your deliberation. And there were kind of six items that were relatively recurring themes for those. And I won't, in no particular order, but the six of those items, I would say, are other potential locations here in the city of Southfield. So I'm going to call up Steve Englehart from Englehart Realty. He's a consultant that works directly with our company and can describe for you some of those other site locations that we looked at and frankly why they're not feasible for us to move. Good evening, members of the Planning Commission Mayor. Thank you for the body to speak to. Um, my name is Steve Engelhart. I am the president of Engelhart Realty and Investment Inc., 30,100 Telegraph Road, Bingham Farms, Michigan. I've been working with Walmart for over 20 years in the site selection process. Um, Southfield is a, a great community and the sweet spot of what uh, Walmart likes to see in their there are markets. Um, there's a multitude of reasons that go into specific site selection. Um, your population densities, you have nearly 50,000 people in a two mile radius with about a 70,000 um, median household income. It's uh, again the seats, a sweet spot. We look at competitive um, information, not only of our stores, but competitors. We look at road patterns, we look at uh, disposable income. Uh, as I said, we've uh, been looking in the market for quite some time and have looked at many other <coughs> properties in that Northland vicinity. I'm not with your DDA director. We've talked about the Home Depot. It's a little bit too tight. We'd have to move Northland Drive potentially by an office building adjacent. Uh, we've looked at the Armory property. We've looked at the Green Egg Shopping Center. looked at the Hans Building. looked at uh, Tamarock property. We've looked at a trailer park that used to be at 8 Mile and and Telegraph Road. So we've looked at uh, a number of different properties and quite frankly Southfield has a population base and uh, makeup that I think makes sense for more than one store in your community and I would imagine to see that at some point. Good to okay. uh, I'll pass it off to my colleagues after this uh, because another thing that came out of the planning commission was uh, a potential of reducing the hours. The proposal is a 24-hour uh, operation, and I think uh, what came out of it was uh, potentially having a closing time overnight. And I had, there was an email from a resident that said, you know, she opposed the 
project, but you know, so this wasn't going to play here. You know, this, if it was it's either going to be 24 hours and we, we oppose it, or or it's going to be closed during overnight, and I'm still going to oppose it. So my question as comes from a unique perspective, because you know, I, I over the past year I've worked crazy hours uh, for just different things, um, and am young and I'm single. And so the only time that sometimes I've been able to go grocery shopping is at 1 o'clock in the morning. So I go to Meijer, and so I am that person who goes grocery shopping uh, overnight. Uh, it's a very different experience, so it's a calmer experience. But what's interesting about Meijer is that when you go grocery shopping overnight, there are no, it, it's much quieter. It offers someone like me the ability to go when it's convenient for my lifestyle. But it's quieter. There are no cashiers. It's all self-checkout, so it really isn't this big bustling what you would think, you know, a mire at a 12 noon looks like at a mire at a 12 midnight. So it, I, I bring that perspective that I don't see. A, I would like to expand more on what is a proposed, what is it going to look like overnight in terms of what you see in other mires or other WalMarts. Pardon me, uh, overnight in terms of. Uh, capacity, um, in terms of noise, in terms of volume, and then why was the decision discussed, I mean, then that will go to you, Mr. Crow, why was the decision, how did that come about from the Planning Commission considering that? Do you want to go first? Uh, let's start with what it would look like uh, overnight. What comes from our, our preference from the beginning of the project, and we made it pretty clear to not only the residents that we met with, but then the Planning Commission phase, we have our preference operate a 24 hour establishment. Um, there's a multitude of reasons for that. If you have shopped in other retail or grocery stores that are open in those hours, you see some of those reasons. Uh, our employees will be physically in the building 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Most of the retail and grocery industry you will find will have employees in their establishments late at night because that's when the restocking goes on. So from a cost perspective, strictly in generic retail, you already have the stores open, you already have the employees present. So to add a couple of cashiers or to choose to utilize uh, self-scanners or more self-scanners, those are retail decisions that, that all a different retail community makes. So from that perspective, we want to be there to service you. We want to be there for our customers that demand at odd hours, as odd as they may seem for others, whether it's a, a strange shift employed, I've mentioned it in some of our, our public meetings, um, you know, you, you ran out of formula and the only store open is Walmart. So you're up at the store at an odd hour at 3 in the morning to pick up baby formula. That is our preference. Now through the course of those conversations with the local residents on our own, and in addition to the planning commission phase, it's very clear to us, and again I mentioned there were kind of six recurring themes, that the 24-hour operation was a recurring issue for a lot of residents. Not all residents, of course, but there were a <coughs> that the idea of a 24-hour operation just didn't sit well with them in a neighborhood community. I mentioned that we have 82 stores uh, that are super centers. We have nine discount stores. Of those total 91 stores, there are 17 of our locations here in the state that are limited on hours. The nine discount stores, because again, they don't offer the full complement of grocery. Um, and those that are being requested, as we mentioned earlier with Roseville for expansion, we're requesting 24 hours with their expansion. The other stores are based on communities. Some communities, based on demographics that we see and our choice, do not operate 24 hours. In other communities, those were restrictions that council placed on the stores in their community. So oh, sorry. that's that is the background of how that conversation started. And so in our communication uh, last week when we were here before the planning commission, if their preference was to approve their recommendation to this body that it be limited in hours, we did request of them that if they were going to make that recommendation, that we would be comfortable with the 6 a.m. to midnight scenario. We did ask that they give us one day for that exemption and that, of course, Black Friday holiday. Um, there's a number of reasons that go into that that I can expand upon if you all see fit, and I'll turn it over to Mr. Pro for any other questions. Yeah, through the chair, um, the 24-hour issue wasn't a repetitive issue. I, I received 30 letters, emails, 
many phone calls up to the public hearing. And some people, I even spoke to a woman an hour or two before the meeting. Her only concern was that it not be open 24 hours, and she gave me plenty of other examples of 24-hour stores in the area that could serve and limited hours of operation. But um, we tried to legitimately, we tried to address all legitimate concerns of the residents and some of the overlapping of other undercurring themes of safety, traffic, site circulation, cut through traffic, noise and lighting were all tied into 24 hours of, of operation. It wasn't a unanimous <coughs> decision by the Planning Commission, but the majority felt that by limiting the hours of operation, it would help placate and reduce some of the other legitimate concerns that the residents have, and that's why it was, it was made a recommendation as part of it. We have 21 conditions. This was another condition that was added to the recommendation. Okay. That, that satisfies me, and I was just curious as to why that was a, a hanging point. Um, so I will send that to the chair. Uh, Mr. Perconti. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, be patient if I can't read my script in here, but I'm going to try to get through this. Uh, I really want to um, uh, focus on, you can sit down, focus on, on uh, the land use because uh, that's very important to me is the zoning of this particular property. And uh, the request, if I understand you right, is to be zoned B3 from from 12 Mile Road to the shopping center at the light, we watch of Angeles. What are the other uses if zoned B3 could be applied to this uh, property? The reason I'm asking that question is, is that if um, if a petition came in, for example, for a uh, strip uh, shopping, uh, and this uh, particular request is for uh, building on 13 acres. How much uh, strip shopping could I guess you could put on 13 acres? And, and what kinds of uses could for, you for the chair? Try to use it. I will. Um, I will read all of the permitted uses in the proposed B3 district, mm -hmm. and then it's based on meeting the parking, setback, and other um, dimensional requirements as to how big building, building may be. But uses permitted in the proposed B3 district include but are not limited to the following. Medical offices, including clinics and medical laboratories, banks and similar financial institutions, post offices, private clubs or lodges, nursery schools, photographic and interior decorating studios, photographic reproduction, blueprinting and print shops, funeral homes, establishments that perform personal services on premises, stores of generally recognized retail nature, veterinary clinics and hospitals, publicly owned buildings and utilities, establishments of profession or similar trades, assembly halls and similar places of assembly, open air retail sales, plant materials and sales of lawn furniture, playground equipment and garden supplies, hotels, restaurants including bar lounge and carry out, and accessory buildings and uses customarily incidental to any of the above permitted uses. Uses permitted subject to special approval in the proposed B3 district include, but are not limited to the following. Recreation centers, motor vehicle washing facilities, gasoline stations, automobile, automobile repair and service facilities, automobile and truck sales and showrooms, freestanding restaurants including bar lounge and carry out restaurants, drive-in and fast food restaurants, open air display, sale of vehicles, specialty retail sales, executive, administrative, and professional office, motels, and theaters. Of course, the special approval uses have special requirements that they would have to meet in order to, to be approved. There are no set limitations, maximums, or minimums on square footages of any of these uses with the exception that they meet parking and setback and dimensional requirements of that B3 district. Would it be fair to say that 13 acres was zoned uh, strip uh, commercial, that the parking uh, numbers would be approximately the same? That's correct. Um, presently, the four corners of uh, 12 Mile Road and Southfield, um, two in Lathrop Village and two of them in the city of Southfield, uh, three of them zoned uh, 
commercial and, and uh, the one we're discussing tonight is not. In your experience as a planner, um, what would be normally, if it brought together by any petitioner to request the same kind of commercial zone applied to where the church is as it is on the other three corners? Yeah, through the chair, I mean, we, we look at um, the corners are, are typically reserved for commercial type of development. But we then sort of look at what is the road designed to handle, and that what what capacity Southfield Road has, what capacity Twelve Mile Road has, has as much to dictate what the uses are in those intersections as the land use itself. But typically, um, you, you'll find four corners being of 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 like either all residential or all commercial. The um, the one that lays up on the southeast corner used to be an A and store and then was uh, Mike's produce at that corner so uh, I'm just mentioning that because uh, that was a similar kind of use that is used in a V3. Um, we had a proposal at this site once before. Uh, were you here the planner or I, I don't that was, that was before my time, but we did we did do our own work. That was uh, plan was 2008, and I believe it was a mixed use proposal that included office, retail, and some limited multiple family. If I if I'm correct. So there was there was another one besides that that showed storage and a McDonald's. I've and, heard that too, but and that was uh, never went forward because they couldn't uh, hit the. Property at the right price, I guess. To in that particular case, zoning. I don't think they actually applied. It was just talked about. We we looked at what was actually an application, and but I have heard that storage facility and a fast food was looked at it for that intersection. Uh, what is the present condition of the church and school and parking lot? If you visit the site, of course. Well, uh, I'll, I know that the, the parking lot is overgrown. I mean, there's there's visible weeds growing through the asphalt. I know that um, the building hasn't been probably kept up as, as much as it should. And there's changing the fence, and, and it's not in the best condition right now, currently. I know. I'm usually, I'm usually embarrassed because I got married at St. Bede's and and the old one, which is the gymnasium today or before. Uh, anyways, in, in the condition of the shopping center, then is that the light at Edwards? You've gone through that over I, I know it. I know it does have some vacancies and uh, hasn't been probably kept up um, to our standards that we'd like to see. Part of that has to do with visibility. Part of that has to do with market conditions. But it's being underutilized right now. Uh, the petitioner has uh, that I'm aware of at. Um, that I noticed is that uh, Pontiac Trail in Haggerty, uh, one in Troy, and a new one in Novi. Uh, th is this request uh, the same style as the one that is being proposed? Do you have any? I, I, I do know. Of, we, we do a lot probably of. Probably the new one's in Novi, isn't it? The newest one is in Novi. We do, I do a lot of research on these types of developments. And it really depends if they're developer finance versus independent finance or whether it's part of a larger conglomerate. That has a lot to do with dictating the architectural style. Um, and I, I believe the Novi model is slightly bigger than, than what's being proposed. I believe our architectural embellishments are greater than what was recently built at Novi. Some of the other site features are similar, but I think we have a higher end style than what was just recently built at no uh, The city has looked at uh, the widening of Southfield Road um, and has uh, recently looked at uh, the width and the median that is proposed. Um, unfortunately, the, the timing for the funding has been set back a little bit. Uh, but is there enough room if this property is zoned B3? Um, and setbacks far enough away that we do not have to take additional properties through the chair. So, I, and the other question is if it's burned and landscaped, 
Does that affect the Birmingham landscaping that is presently proposed? The, through the chair, the Birmingham landscaping is actually on property that's where the proposed um, Walmart is, not in the right of way. I believe they've dedicated 42 additional feet along Southfield Road in the right of way to the Road Commission of Oakland County as part of the park parcel. So um, we are working with, I know the city engineer and myself have been attending meetings with the Road Commission of Oakland County. They're currently going through their 18th month environmental assessment. We've commented on the width of the land proposed landscape burn, what uh, the, uh, including complete street components of bike lanes and sidewalks. And um, uh, they have reviewed this proposal. They've reviewed the traffic impact study and they find it all um, within with what they are planning for the long-term development of Southfield Road. And the petitioner has proposed a city arrangement of their landscaping at the corner. Um, is that possible if um, if the council decides to to approve this site and and uh, in that amenity? Is it possible to get the Marathon gas station across the street to have a similar kind of corner so that we can have a nice entranceway with the city uh, from the south? Yes, I, I think that's all uh, reasonable. We uh, actually talking with Lathrop Village about creating gateway into their district and ours. Is, this would kind of set the standard for the four corners mm -hmm. that could be replicated. Um, the wrought iron fencing, the brick piers that go up Southfield Road. Uh, currently, there's two existing smart bus stops. Patrons are literally sitting on the grass or standing in the mud. They're willing to upgrade those with our new contemporary bus shelters and provide key walks, um, put the uh, additional urban gateway plaza with the, the benches and, and the other details, and that could easily be replicated on the cross the street. I have another question, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Jordan. Thank you. Um, this is the first time I've had an opportunity to see the site and, and take a look in detail of what's being proposed. And this is going to be a very, very difficult situation because making a decision for or against uh, bringing a Walmart here, particularly for, will, will really change the character of our city forever. Um, and that's, that's a very uh, awesome task make sure that we make the right decision. We see tons of emails for and against. And so, you know, it's really incumbent upon this council and even myself to just make sure that I all have all the questions answered so that I can make <coughs> the best decision for the community. And I want to begin with um, traffic. And I need some clarification in terms of the slide that you showed saying that traffic would only increase by 5%, but yet we're having parking spaces of 682 cars. That doesn't compute. Can you give me some clarification of that? Mr. Chairman, if I can, to the councilwoman's question, and I can turn it over to, to Robert again, who did the, the physical traffic study to provide you additional <laughs> detail. I would like additional detail in right And here. where we are, at this point is South Hill Road roughly generates 50,000 cars on a daily basis. And 12 Mile Road is in the 20,000 vehicle range. So what you see in that study is based off of standards that are created across the United States and traffic studies that are utilized. It talks about pass-through traffic, it talks about other items on, on what kind of traffic Walmart will generate at that physical location. There might be an easier way for me to describe it for you. Um, so I will do that and then again I'll turn it back over to Robert for specific details if you have follow-up questions. An average Walmart store in Michigan will process about 4,300 transactions a day. That's through the course of a 24-hour period. Now those numbers, as you can imagine, are skewed. You, you, we have fewer transactions at 7 o'clock in the morning than you would say at 7 o'clock in the evening. You also will see for fewer transactions on Monday or Tuesday mornings than you would obviously Friday evening in particular or into Saturday or Sunday. And that's pretty much standard across the retail community. So an average store will generate 4,300 transactions in here in Michigan each day. We have 70,000 vehicles running through that intersection. If every single solitary one of those transactions results in a vehicle driving through that intersection, which it won't, but let's just say 
my math is correct about 20% of the time. I think that's about right. And I'll turn it back over to Rob now to talk about That's my simple math based on transactions. I'll let Robert tell you why why they utilized the study and why the study itself is the math. Thank you. Council 1 and Jordan, to answer your question on the parking issue, Walmart customers will arrive and depart at different times. So there could be 110 that arrive maybe at 445, and they may not leave until 545. Well, there could be another 100 that might arrive at 545 or 530. So the parking lot will fill up in that manner, but not all at once. Everyone doesn't show up all at the same time. The only day, really, that the parking would experience some congestion, obviously, would be Black Friday, where there are numerous shoppers that will arrive anywhere from 8 p.m. on a Thursday evening through Friday early morning. But again, the traffic is sporadically entered into the development. It is not all funneled all at one time. And as far as the parking, the code, we are actually following the city's code for parking. Walmart's requirement is actually far, far less than what the city's requirement is. What would your requirement be? It is one per 250 gross usable floor area. So that would come out to how many parking spaces? It's 130,000 square foot buildings, so probably just slightly over maybe 600, or right in the high 500s. I'm just doing this off the top of my head. I guess it would be 520. Okay. I'm going to jump around sort of. I'm going to get back to the traffic. So with the traffic that the study that you've done and what you proposed with the new traffic signals and the new lights, who's going to cover that expense? Is that going to fall on the city or is Walmart? No, that cost would be fully the responsibility of Walmart. The traffic signals, too, they would be, again, they're state of the art. Each location is well into the six-digit range for replacement of the traffic signals. Through the chair to Ms. Jordan, could I ask him to elaborate on the SCAT system and how that might maybe, Robert, if you could talk about current situation and then how the SCAT system times through the turning lights and how that may help in off-peak and peak situations. There currently is. You'll see there are cameras out there now. And I know I had one of the planning commission members discuss that he sits at the light during a red light and he'll sit there and there are no other cars on 12 Mile Road. Obviously, there's some concern that even the road commission has with the current operation of that light that may not be functioning exactly as perfect as can be. And that is one of the reasons that signal is in need of modification. I know the road commission just finished one down at, I believe it's Southfield and I believe it's either 11 or 10 Mile Road. And they just converted that into a box fan signal. So again, we would be looking at modernizing the entire intersection. In addition, with modernizing, again, if you can picture spreading those signal heads out, making a much safer location, it would also space out the pedestrian signal heads a lot better on all four poles as well. What's the square footage of the stores in Novi and Troy? The Novi store is approximately 155,000, right in that range. It's just about 25 to 27,000 square foot larger. The Troy Walmart, as it exists today, is approximately 130,000, but it is currently being expanded and it will end up in about, I believe, 100, somewhere in the 170 range. So it will be larger than what we're looking at here. This proposed store is 130,124 square feet. Site selection. I sort of heard two different things 
Mr. Chairman, uh, to the councilwoman's question, I want to be very clear about this. We are looking at this proposed site. We think it's a great fit not only for us as a company, but for our customers, 12 Mile and Southfield. Uh, what in, Mr. Engelhardt was talking about earlier is through the course again of our public hearings, our private hearings that were public with residents, and again through the planning commission process, one of the recurring themes was we want Walmart, but not here. Uh, that's where we're looking. That's where what we're proposing. Now, having said that, we also wanted to be responsive to the residents that have asked that question to let them know that we have, as a company, looked at those other site locations here in your city. Some of those site locations just flat up don't work. As you can imagine, when a company of our size comes in um, and the potential seller finds out that it's a company of our size coming in, the price itself doubles or triples or whatever it might be, and it doesn't make it economically feasible. What Mr. Engelhart was alluding to is there are other locations here in Southfield which there is a potential we could be back before you in, in five years or ten years or whenever it may be saying that we would like to add another location to the southern end of the community or wherever it might be. And those decisions, again, are based on a process that goes on back at our home office. We have real estate teams that work with gentlemen like Mr. Engelhardt to go around and look at population densities, see where we're currently servicing our customer, to see where it does make sense to add another facility. And it's not common, but it also does happen, that we do have two facilities located very close to each other. And the most recent example of that would be in the Warren and Sterling Heights location along Van Dyke Road. We have an old discount store at 12 Mile Road in Van Dyke. Uh, the discount store was not able to be expanded at that time. And so the company decided to maintain our lease obligation on the property that we lease. And then went two miles up the road out of the Warren City border into the Sterling Heights and built a brand new supercell. And while we were all here this evening waiting for your all and your deliberations, some of our other team members were actually before the Warren City Council because they are we have the company has requested and they have approved <coughs> us to go back into that original Warren location with now a full blown super sign. So we will have two fully functioning operating super centers literally within two miles of each other. Um, tell me about the whole city taxes. 130000 per year. Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, that, again, again, I apologize for misspeaking. There's a lot of numbers through there. The, the new real property generated by this site, we have estimated to be about 316000 of new real property. <clears throat> and then that number, of course, breaks down on the formula with the state and the county and the city, and it's roughly a third, if I've done the math correct. So you're talking about roughly $100,000 or maybe a little higher than that of what I assume will be general fund revenue that, that you all, as the elected body for the community, will decide what it was appropriated for. Um, I want to talk about the site store, the, the entrance to the store based upon your PowerPoint. It looks as if there's only going to be one main entrance, and that's off of Southfield Road at the light, getting into the property, and then you have one driveway that's in front of the funeral home. Those are the only two ways that you'll be able to access. Yeah, and, and I'm, sorry, I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, uh, Councilwoman, um, and again, for council members that may have had that same confusion, the both entry points to the location are on the north side of the store. And if you walk up to really any uh, retail location, but particularly for Walmart, what you'll typically see is the right-hand side. Again, if I'm looking to the north, so you are all in the parking lot looking back at me as the physical store that we're proposing, the right-hand side location closest to Southfield Road would be the 
grocery stack entrance, again, closer to Southfield Road. Okay. Again, the site and the building location. You're proposing to put a raw iron fence from 12 miles back to the end of the property. Well, correct. It, it's up behind you. That basically, the wrought iron fence would be a low level. I'm going I'm to just say waste time, but they can give you the specifics. That would start at 12 mile and run all the way along the sidewalk along the Southfield Road up up to the Edwards entry point on the very northeast corner of the property. That would be, again, like a waste high wrought iron with the, the brick, um, brick pillars spaced out along the way for that side. The eight foot wall that we're describing is on the west side of the property. And again, there is an existing six foot white brick wall that's rather dilapidated that runs along those property owners' homes today. So what we're proposing is to take that existing wall out and put a new wall in again that would basically start where the entry road on Edwards starts. It would be eight feet all the way down until the, the funeral home property starts and then right turn to go again to abut the, the very north end of the funeral home property. And you'll have a buffer, you'll have a buffer in between the residents and the business. Correct. Follow me up this slide up. Uh, could you repeat what you said about the signage? I know on the north elevation, the entrance, you have the Walmart. Was there any other signage that? <coughs> yeah, and again, when we, when we first started with um, with our with our resident meetings, um, and they'll pull it up here so you can see it. We had talked about just using a standard pole with the sign on, um, and then that sign there would be located at the. the Co-mingled entry point with the funeral home right off the 12th line, and that was one of the very first things that residents said, "Whoa, wait a minute! We don't want some, you know, great big huge sign up there shining into our our neighborhood like, you know, it's a, a, a fast food restaurant off the highway." So, plan was changed to take that sign off the 12 mile and then to utilize the one you see on the further right hand side, which is one of the monument style signs. And then it would be similar also at the, the northeast corner for the Edwards entry point. Right, thank you. Uh, back to One last time. question. You talked about renewable energy. Can you go in a little bit more detail in terms of how this door would contribute overall to Walmart? Well, it is, again, I, I, the reason I gave you some of those numbers is because it, it was asked to Mr. Duke when he was on with President Clinton on his sustainability program. So some folks may have been able to actually see that as well. And the reason that we make these decisions work is because A, it makes us good corporate stewards of our planet, but it also is something that we're hearing from our customers that they want. And so in a Walmart store, you will see things that you won't find in other retail establishments. And the simple is skylighting. And the reason we use skylighting is more natural lighting provides more natural light. We have to use less energy. But there's other things that we do as, as a company that are all part of our sustainability platform. And all the information is online and everything that we're trying to do, and whether it's plastic bags or what we've done in trash reduction and recycling programs at our own stores, all of those things help our company to forego costs. And our model is, as I said, it's very simple. Save money so you can live better. And if we don't provide everyday low costs, we can't provide everyday low pricing. And those sustainability programs that you'll see, um, the ideas can come from any associate, they come from other folks that we work with, other people in the retail community, but you will see things in our store that you won't find in most other retail establishments. Through the chair to Ms. Jordan. Um, some of the conditions of the Planning Commission requested is um, electric vehicle charging stations be provided on site, as well as the uh, LED lighting for parking lots, which is also part of that sustainability. I would like to receive a copy of the transfer report, and uh, we'll see what happens. I cannot say where I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Frazier. Yeah, I have a number of questions to ask. Uh, uh, and I'd like to start off where uh, Ms. Jordan left off, and that was with traffic. Um, in your presentation, you said that uh, 
Southfield Road and 12 Mile, the traffic is E or F at certain times of the day. And uh, E uh, is and F are pre court. That's almost like parking lots. Um, and that uh, Edwards is a B level traffic. Of course, not very much goes up and goes in and out of Edwards. You can't go you can't go east on one Edwards only about a half a block for you uh, just on the corner of Edwards and Southfield, so there's not much traffic generated there. It would be coming out, you know, there aren't that many houses down on Edwards that I would imagine would come all the way to Southfield Road, but so I can understand how that'd be. My concern is as it is with a lot of people that have emailed me about the, the traffic. Um, your statement is that it really won't be that much worse. Well, E and F, you don't have to be that much worse. That's not in the power of Pardon me? But, uh, you know, my concern is what are you doing to make it better? And uh, I know you went through the uh, thing that you're not going to uh, have uh, uh, traffic signals designed the way they are now. They're going to hang out on the post, but you know, on arms. But uh, I don't know how that makes traffic go that much better. It's a traffic signal is a traffic signal. Right? Um, I'm still listening for how you're going to make the traffic better. Because there are certain times that you're going to have a lot of traffic. Without, without Walmart being there, you don't have holiday traffic that, you know, Valentine's Day, uh, all of the holiday that we're in right now, the Christmas shopping, it's, that generates traffic if, if Walmart is there. And we can only guess how much traffic is going to be because you're going to have flash sales and you're going to generate a lot of a lot of people and, and you've already identified Black Friday as one of the heavy heavy uh, <coughs> shopping days. But I'm I'm still concerned. What are you doing? What are you going to do to relieve the traffic mm -hmm. from D or E and F up to maybe C? Mr. Chairman, to the councilman's question, traffic is absolutely a concern for this location. There's no question about it. And I made it clear in our presentation, particularly last week, I wanted to make sure that there was no confusion from any planning commission members, nor any confusion for you all, or the mayor, or the chief, or anyone else.
everything we can within our power to address that concern. I'm not going to tell you it's going to be perfect. I certainly can't tell you that it will be dramatically better. What we can tell you is that we think we're doing everything in our power to mitigate our impact and will improve it, particularly at certain times of the day. The traffic will absolutely be improved. And then there are times when our customers or large groups of customers or holiday season rolls around that you will see increased traffic from Walmart. A lot of those increased traffic days from Walmart do not correlate with regular morning rush hour, afternoon rush hour because of the holiday season. Black Friday is a good example. Some people work on Black Friday, some people don't. So it's really hard for us to stand here and tell you every single solitary day that we operate. Tuesday will be better, Wednesday will be worse. I imagine that Friday night rush hour traffic will get impacted by this location. No question. Okay. Friday morning traffic? Probably not. Saturday traffic? Absolutely. But again, Saturday's not rush hour traffic. So it really does vary. What we're trying to do is say, here's what we have, here's the problem we know that exists, here's what we're offering to do, and in addition to that, we know that the county, maybe someday they get to it, maybe someday they don't, but as the, the councilman mentioned earlier, that's why we're dedicating that frontage space along Southfield Road for if and when the county decides to go through with the master plan and change Southfield Road into an actual boulevard. Again, those are the only things that we know we can physically control. Okay, um, see, I see the traffic problem just slightly different than than it was just explained to me. Because you said your real concern is your customer. I'm concerned about your customer, but I'm also concerned about the folks that aren't your customer. Uh, and right now, I've had people say the traffic at that corner is so bad, they'll drive three miles out of their way to not have to go through that corner. Well, adding 5% more traffic is not going to mitigate the problem. It's going to aggravate the problem as far as, as I can see. And and yet we we're only speculating based on past experiences with where you place Walmart. Now I was at the I was at the Novi store as well, you know. That's off the beaten path. You know, six cars go down through that maze to get back to the Walmart. And that's not a traffic jam by any stretch of the imagination. 12 mile at Southfield Road is always a heavily trafficked um, corner. Now I have, another, I have another question, and it has to do with uh, going in the westernmost driveway, which is near the funeral home. Uh, if I remember right, you can, if I'm traveling east on 12 mile road, I can go into your your property by making a left turn, correct? Okay. How have you looked at opposing traffic that someone wants to turn into the gas station or someone wants to turn into one of the, the commercial buildings along 12 mile road? They want to turn left into those because they're going west and I'm going east, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to get, uh, get across the westbound lanes. There, to, to that point, Mr. Chairman, there, there are two things that we've tried to identify here in the site plan, and you can see it behind you, uh, again, to try to address that concern. Uh, and again, that was a recurring theme with our meetings with the residents on a multitude of levels. One being the, the circumstances where the funeral home had a very large funeral. Mm -hmm. There would be parking on Guy Street, there would be parking across 12 mile. Um, pedestrians particularly that were visiting the funeral home crossing 12 mile in the winter months, even more precarious. So there's a couple of things that we're trying to address with this site plan. The first one is as you described. If you're headed eastbound on 12 mile road and you're approaching Southfield Road and you want to enter our Walmart, you do make that left hand turn that you described in order to enter our Walmart facility. And you can see behind you, there are no entry points or queues that would mitigate that traffic flow. 
that allows folks to <coughs> make the loan and come in. Part of the challenge that was described to us is that, let's say again, you're at an eastbound along the 12 mile road, mm -hmm. and I have to be the very first car after sitting for some time in the left turn lane on northbound Southfield Road to make a left hand turn to go west. So I'm turning left on the 12 mile road off the of Southfield, and you're coming east to make that. So you're going to have to wait either for me to pass or for multiple cars to pass in order to make that turn. And what we're trying to do in this site plan there is to get additional traffic that we would be providing that would be making that left hand turn traffic out of the beat path and extend that right turn lane along 12 mile road. Again, so that our traffic that we're generating is moving over to the right in order to enter the Walmart parking and clear as much as we can physically control from standard westbound flow of traffic along 12 mile. The other thing that you will see in the site plan, and again, it was reviewed from, it was brought up during the planning commission things, and Mr. Malone and the rest of the team, his team, is that as a separate property owner. That was another concern, because again, that same movement, you're headed eastbound on 12 mile, you turn left on the guy street in order to enter the funeral home. Because that driveway was situated so close, if the first car pulls in and stops, and the second car pulls in right behind them, the third car is stuck out on 12 mile road, blocking the physical road. So we worked with that property owner, tried to devise a plan, moving that physical location further to the north along Guy Street to try to again mitigate a concern that's been brought up to us from residents. But I don't want to belittle the point that that's, we're, we're doing everything that we can do with this zoning request and with our site plan for the zone to mitigate an existing problem, knowing that we're at, we could be adding to that problem. There's no question about it. We're doing everything we can. I can't, if it doesn't get approved and another corporation or another entity or whoever it is six months from now, or a year from now, or five years from now, if that property sits vacant, comes up with an agreement. Sure. That doesn't mean they're going to close the entry points that we've described. Mm -hmm. There are existing access points. If those access points were utilized for whoever that individual or that corporation was, I don't think they'd be responsible in trying to mitigate the problem. We're do, we've done, in our opinion, everything that we can physically do to help control the problem as best we can. Again, without the road commission coming through and building you a, a, a brand new boulevard from 14 mile, I guess, all the way down to 696. Um, I see another, another, I appreciate your answer, but I also see another problem, and that is with an old left turn coming out of the westernmost driveway, uh, you can turn right, but if someone doesn't want to stand in line on Edward Street and they decide to go up the westernmost driveway, west on 12 mile road, I can see a lot of people making U turns because they really want to go east. Mm -hmm. So they go west and they go half a block down near the high school and make a U turn after they clear the traffic that's stacked up at the corner mm -hmm. and, co and come back east. So uh, Councilman, I think that's a very legitimate concern. I think that's why you'll see in our site plan what we've designed is basically a three-lane road off of Edwards mm -hmm. so that any traffic entering or exiting the Walmart property to the north would be on a three-lane road. You have a right lane, a center lane, and a left lane to allow that traffic to queue, to allow plenty of space for folks coming in to either turn right to the north to the other property or to turn left to come south into a Walmart store. But again, the traffic patterns of individual residents in this community, that may be a concern. You're concerned about making illegal U-turns further on down the road. My answer to that is simply, it sounds like an opportunity to generate revenue in this community from the robust and force. I, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I was going to suggest maybe we want to put a little, another police precinct. Uh, we, we have actually done that in other communities. Um, Mr. Frazier, while we're on traffic, could I just uh, sure, go chime in on this? Here's the boss. One of my uh, uh, 
Uh, I have sat many a time on 12 mile road running to go north, uh, headed east, but I want to go north on, on south of the road, sometimes in rush hour, uh, not to mention even uh, an icy day. Um, the traffic is backed up beyond south of Lathrop High School. That's, That's right. far down in the That's center lane. Right. Um, and uh, one of the thoughts I had uh, about this, I, I really didn't know until tonight how many curb cuts the project uh, we were proposing. But one of um, my thoughts was a double left turn lane um, at Walmart's expense so that the people that wanted to go into Walmart could be in the far left lane and the people that wanted to go north on um, uh, South Hill Road uh, would be separated in the traffic. It's very similar to uh, Open Mall, for instance, where they have the double turn lanes. It's a way of stacking traffic. It's allowing people to get through that intersection. You know, you, you've, um, uh, you, you wouldn't be a good businessman if you said, I, wa I want to keep my customers from getting into the parking lot. I mean, it only makes sense. So, I, but I think Mr. Fraser's question really gets to the heart of this is uh, we have a tremendous amount of pass-through traffic in that intersection, with or without a Walmart. I don't think that leaving the center lane as it is, is the answer. Um, Mr. Uh, Byron. Sorry, Council President, I apologize that this is one of your first duties with the, with the gallery. Um, I do know that we looked at um, a recommendation or an idea of even considering
know we've, we've gone into pass by traffic and, and, and you've heard and you will hear a lot about that. Um, a site such as this one will experience a lot of pass by traffic. Those are not new trips to this development. Um, we were conservative in our analysis. Um, we do have full support by the Road Commission on what our analysis finds. They agree that signal replacement, right turn overlaps will in, uh, mitigate Walmart's impact. And that's what we're looking at doing. We can't take a level of service E condition, E as an Edward, and make it a level of service B condition. Um, that's probably a 10 or 15 year goal for, uh, for Oakland County Road Commission. Now, whether you are to have uh, another development that goes in further north on Southfield Road and, and deny them because Southfield Road is simply overloaded, um, but they demonstrate to you that they have more than mitigated their impacts. And that is what a traffic impact study looks at. Um, we're not here, the Road Commission is the body that, that is here to you know, improve the level of service maybe from an E to a B or C. And I believe that is their goal. And uh, hopefully in the next uh, you know, five to 10 years, or, or even less than that, that there, there will be some modifications to Southfield Road. But again, we're here before you this evening to show that we're mitigating our impacts and we're creating the best possible well, access. Thank you for your response. And I'll back to Mr. Brady. Yeah, um, you're a pretty good straight man because uh, you're leading into one of the other concerns that I had about traffic. And that is one of the uh, things that I've heard advertised is that when Walmart comes in, it brings in other businesses because Walmart becomes the nucleus of other businesses that want to locate near, nearby. Well, if that's the case, we're right back to the traffic problem again because if they're not, if they're not going to go to Walmart, they're going to go to the other business that's pretty close to Walmart. And so, uh, what I'm suggesting, or what I'm asking, and I and I need to ask our our city administrator, is that our next meeting, I would like to have someone from the road commission in attendance at the meeting, and I'd like them. Here's here's what I'd like them to uh, bring with them: the information of another intersection that was similar to this that uh, they use the calming procedures that they're suggesting for this corner and what happened after it and how much did it improve traffic. I'd like to hear from the road commission. I want to hear it through someone else that says I've talked to the road commission and this is what they say. I want to hear from the road commission themselves. So I want to see how how good their engineering has improved the another sec another intersection someplace that's, that had similar concerns as ours. If, if I may, Councilman Frazier, uh, you had mentioned the no buy store earlier. Yes. And uh, I was involved in that with the traffic as well. And uh, the outlying intersections, uh, this did go through the road commission for the no buy site, uh, specifically Crescent Boulevard. And Novi Road. It's one of the heaviest traveled intersections in the city of Novi. It was, and I can tell you, uh, again, going through the process in the city of Novi, I'm sure can, can confirm, it was a serious issue for traffic. Uh, they were very concerned. They were concerned with the dual lefts coming off the, the, um, the, the highway. They were concerned with how much traffic Walmart's going to add. How much traffic is Walmart going to add to Grand River? What are they going to do to Grand River and Novi Road, which is a very overcapacity intersection as it exists? And we had similar meetings. Traffic, traffic's an issue. Walmart is going to really cause issues. Uh, to this day, since the opening of the Novi store, those intersections have operated uh, as indicated in our studies. There have been no concerns or complaints on those intersections. Um, now, I know you heard earlier, internally, a different story. There, there's much more capacity, but on the outlying intersections, the main intersections, those were heavily concerned intersections. And to this day, they, they operate um, as indicated in the study. And they operate fine. Yeah, but even before Walmart was there, they had the double left turn into the... They did. But there was there was concern that the dual left, which uh, you know was currently, it backs up quite a ways, that Walmart would back that dual left because that's the main way to get into the town center from the uh, interstate would back the left up into the ramps and
cause major problems onto the ramps, and that, that, that simply does not happen. Yeah, most of that traffic out there is just north-south traffic. It's, it's uh, and only coming, you know, coming out of the, the center. The main traffic on, on Novi Road is north-south. Here we have the four corners. You don't have traffic typically coming out of the, the shopping center going across Novi Road to the west side, not large bunches. I would go down to the Grand River and Novi Road. That that would be the, the four-legged intersection that would experience. The but that's so far away from that is so far away from Walmart that I don't know how we can compare it to where we're at because we're right at Walmart here. So, but okay, sure. okay, thank you. Um, one question that uh, we talked about, and I know that we don't. And we can't, I, I, I can't make a decision on your uh, hourly wages, and you, you won't be able to answer that question. But you were very careful when you <coughs> talked about the hourly wages, and you said that um, the average hourly wage for full time workers is $12.61. Right. My question to you is. What percentage of your employees are full-time workers? <laughs> I don't have the answer for them this night. <laughs> Can you get that for us? Because that's going to make a big difference. It's going to be almost as significant as Jeremy being on council. <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's going to make a difference. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, what I've been watching on television, people complaining about, and even uh, one of the, I don't know if it was 20, 20 or 60 Minutes, had a, had a uh, program on uh, large uh, big box companies such as Walmart, and they mentioned Walmart, use a very sophisticated software, scheduling software for employees so that they can have their employees at their store whenever they want to without giving full consideration for what else is going on in the employee's life. So they might need you for, they need an employee for three hours because that's the way the traffic comes in. And I'm saying that you're doing but you got mentioned it. I'm saying what I saw. And then they, and they can't, they aren't working full time, but they can't afford to have another part-time job someplace else because when you call, you want them there and um, it's it's very difficult for someone to make enough money that they can provide for their family, especially when they're on the benefits. Now, uh, you already know that I can tell a story. And I'm going to tell you what this sort of sounds like. I think I'm a pretty nice guy. But when I walk across my lawn in the summertime, the ants don't think that I'm a very nice guy. Because I don't care about the ants. I just want to get from one side of my lawn to the other. And if some ants have to uh, pay the price, <laughs> so be it. Um, and that's as close as I can come in a short bit of time to say what I'm, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. So I would like to, as uh, uh, our president has asked, if you can bring that information, what percentage of your hourly employees are full-time versus part-time? And, uh, you know, I don't want to bifurcate it so much that it's that we're straining it at uh, small numbers, but uh, it sounds to me like there are a lot of uh, employees that work only enough that they're under the amount of hours that would allow them benefits. So, and I'm sure you've heard that before. And Mr. Chief, uh, Council mm -hmm. President, I assume that mm -hmm. those exact same questions were asked of other retailers that were approved for this body as they came into your community. And you Most other them. retailers don't have the reputation that Walmart has. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and some we did want some yeah. of the yeah. Well, then you can help. But we're, I'll do my best. 
Yes. We may not be equal with all our employees, but we're equitable. Okay? Um, one question. What kind of security do you have in your parking lot, especially at night, if you're going to be a 24-hour? Yeah, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm glad that the councilman has asked that question because, again, that was part of the recurrent theme with the 24-hour operations, crime, impact on crime. Uh, there were lots of examples that were given. Um, and, again, I want to remind council members in particular I'll tell the story if the chairman will allow me to in a moment as well. We have over 4,000 retail establishments in the United States. <coughs> Those 4,000 retail establishments process roughly 4,000 transactions a day, which means we run anywhere in the neighborhood of six mil 16 million transactions through the course of any given day. And so when I read over the holiday break, about a poor woman who had a medical concern on a flight and was not able to access the flight back home and ended up dying from that flight. It would be unfair for me to stand here and tell you that the airlines cared to kill this poor woman because that isolated incident doesn't take into account the literal hundreds of thousands, if not millions of passengers that we're taking care of on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Now having said all that, what do we do about crime to the store, particularly on a 24 hour operation? It's across the board. That's the answer. We have some stores that operate with a private security contract to patrol the parking lot. We have some stores that see no more need for crime or parking lot, if you will, enforcement other than the standard operations of our associates that go out into the parking lots in the evenings and collect cards. It's entirely driven on the individual store <coughs> and what we need to do to protect our customers and our associates. This store, as proposed, has both camera systems inside the building and camera system outside the building in the parking lot. The company doesn't feel at this point that this is a high crime neighborhood, that it's a high crime area, and we don't think that we will generate any more crime than any other of your big box major retailers will in the community. I'm not asking you to take my word on that. I'm asking you to talk with your staff and particularly your chief of police. Part of the recommendation from the planning commission originally included that we would respond to basically requests and I'll I'll defer to staff to reach you the exact uh, requirement from the Planning Commission on how we would respond to requests from the Chief of Police and from staff regarding crime. We do believe that if you are to move forward and take the recommendation of Council, or excuse me, the Planning Commission, that this store not operate 24 hours. Obviously a big number of that worry for crime is eased, a big percentage. But again, I cannot stand here before you and describe every single solitary action that's happened in a Walmart store in this country or a foreign entity that operate. We'll be here for a very long time. I can only tell you we will handle this store on an individual basis unless the planning, unless the city council has specific requirements for it. In order for a 24-hour operation, for example, the council requires us to have a private security company patrol in the, the parking lot. If the council's preference is that we've heard from the neighborhood uh, that not running 24 hours is a matter of judgment, then that's a decision you all will make and we'll, we'll kind of take it from there. Okay, so we did agree to the planning commission's recommendation to limit hours to 18 hours and I'm assuming that will again mitigate the vast majority of concerns that residents have been voicing today. Okay, so in, you know, the short answer is that it's evidence-based. Evidence-based, and we will obviously be responsive. And in fact, I believe that's the exact wording that the, the, for the conditions from the Planning Commission. And again, I, I would defer to staff to read specifically what that uh, recommendation was. Okay. I'm going to stop and let somebody else talk. I've talked a long time. Mr. Lance is here. Thank you. Thank you.
getting tired already. <laughs> okay. First, I'd like to thank you for your answers. And second, the process has just begun. You have a, a site plan committee presentation to make shortly. Then you're going to come to council and we'll have a public hearing and it'll be over. So uh, I'm not, I haven't, I don't have concerns now. I listen to every single word everybody said. And I think everything will turn out all right. So, thank you for being here tonight, and uh, I'm looking forward to the site plan committee meeting, and I'll have the other process, and we'll, well, everything will turn out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lance. Uh, next, uh, Ms. Seymour. Thank you, Mr. I can see that the location is ideal for Walmart because South Hill is the center of it all and South Hill Road <laughs> is the center of it all because we have a freeway that goes south through Dearborn through communities. We have the traffic coming from the north. You're in the center. It's great for Walmart. It's a great location for Walmart. And all of these issues that are discussed about traffic that you feel you can minimize, once that building, once that project goes in, assuming if it does, the problems that are going to be created by the traffic are ours. They're not yours anymore. And these are major concerns. And I want to explain to you a little bit about my experience. I'm the only person who lives east of Southfield. Southfield Road. I'm the only person. I cross Southfield Road many times during the week. I had to come over here for a meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning and wall-to-wall -wall cars. I mean bumper to bumper, all as far as you can see. I had to go this afternoon, not at, you know, the prime times, the early, late in the morning and early in the afternoon, Southfield Road is impossible. I've traveled all over this country, in Mexico, in, in uh, Toronto, in the, the big cities in California. I love to drive. Big cities in Canada, I need to say. Montreal, so forth. Boston is one of the worst. Um, Mexico City is one of the worst. I love to drive. I will not I will do anything to avoid South Hill Road. I will do anything to avoid 12 miles. I had to be over there two or three times a day. And it's, it's impossible. And no matter what you do with the lights, we're going to have a big problem. And I understand your, the attractiveness from Walmart to that site. I mean, it, I get it. It's, it's great for them because of the traffic. But it's going to be, I think, extremely difficult for it's adding a lot more traffic than what you say. I find that so uh, almost like you know a dream is to think that it's going to have a minor impact on that traffic. It's worse than Telegraph Road. South Hill has become worse than Telegraph Road, and that's my concern. As I say, I I go through there on a regular basis. I will avoid 12 Mile and I will avoid South Hill Road because of the terrible. Any time of the day or night. We most, you know, very few times is it really good. Maybe before traffic starts, maybe 6.30 in the morning, maybe 1 o'clock in the morning. But those are my concerns. And I don't see that we're really going to get the relief that we hope for. And that's all I'm going to say about that. But that is, that the problem that I see is it's only going to get worse. All, everything that everybody says sounds like it's going to be minimal. I don't see how it can be. Scott, you have another uh, question? Well, you know, I, um, I'm sitting here uh, listening with the, uh, the problem in that we're not really weighing whether Walmart should be here or not. I mean, that's not on the agenda. The agenda is 
if the, you don't have to either approve B3 or not approve B3. You have a safe plan that follows their request that you can approve or deny. And, and I just, you know, all of us sit, you can sit down, by the way, I've got no questions for you. But you know, I, I mean, you know, I would have spoken anyway, but I wanted to say this. Everybody's been in these budget meetings and finding out how many dollars that we have lost uh, to we have to provide services. We lost over a billion dollars worth of value in this city. And, and we have to have peace and we have to have fire and we have to have a, a city that operates and cleans the streets and, and picks up the garbage and all the services that everybody has, has seen and, and believes we can continue. And, and somehow we have to develop some of this property because we haven't had any development. Another proposal A and all these other things that are happening to the city like losing our personal property tax and it costs us over eight million dollars and other losses that we are being incurred by the state. That we somehow as a city has to survive. Now, I'm not here back in Walmart, I could care less about Walmart, but I do am concerned about the city. And when someone comes in and brings to our attention that zoning uh, is at this location, then it is either fit for commercial or it's not. I'm not zoning anything for Walmart, I'm zoning something B3, so if Walmart is turned down, what kind of use can this property be to? Now all of us who live in that area know this area, you know that shopping center that Edwards and Eight Miles is, is something that should just be wiped out. I mean I have friends in there that, that have to have buckets of, uh, to catch the water because they're roofs leak. I mean it's embarrassing to see what's happened to the, the church and the school that I went to and cleaned up and painted uh, deteriorate with fences down and, and steel grates bent and weeds come up through the parking lot. Something has to be done. I don't take any pleasure in looking at what's happening to that area. I mean, I was raised in there. My son lives on 12 Mile Road. My other son lives on a Ferretti Plain. And I work there and I go to the bank there at the corner of 12 Mile and Southfield. And I really don't have a problem because I remember when 12 hours was two lanes, and then it was three lanes, and then it was four lanes, and then it was five lanes, and we closed Edward Street because traffic was still trying to divert the traffic until I-696 was built. But I go through that intersection every day, ten times a day, whenever, for errands and everything else, and, and I look at it, I look at it objectively. And because the traffic has been, you know, on the, on, in my emails, and traffic is a thing. And if you don't want Walmart, say you don't want Walmart. But if you're talking about traffic, traffic can always be controlled. We've got traffic, we have traffic on Telegraph and 12 Mile and a Meyer sitting there with car dealerships being there with all kinds of turns and gyrations of cars. You can't even get in the star deli. But everything seems to work after a time. Whether it works perfect or not, not really. It's a pain to make a left-hand turn west of Telegraph Road. But, but somehow, you know, with all that traffic, businesses, they, they work. Uh, people go to them. Uh, and, and somehow, you know, when the, when the road was closed up for, for redevelopment or put the asphalt down, we lost some businesses. But we have miles up of traffic on Telegraph Road, they almost go to 10 miles. So, so traffic is, you know, I don't know a business anywhere that wants to put a building or a business where there's no traffic. I mean, it just doesn't work. And so people who plan for businesses, they look at location, traffic, they look at a whole series of things. They have X amount of dollars to spend. They want the best location for the dollars spent. And, and sometimes, you know, they pick Southfield. And lately, they haven't picked Southfield too often. And we have an opportunity here now to zone something B3. And I don't care if it's Walmart, but at least zone the property to something that somebody can come in with a petition and say, I'd like to have strip commercial or something. I mean, the, the obvious alternative is is continue looking at St. Bede's in the parking lot 
or the shopping center that's deteriorating, and bank that's deteriorating down the street, and say, you know, that's the way we want South Hill to look. You got a no farmer jack anymore. We have no grocery store from Telegraph to Greenfield. There's no place to shop. They go to Hillers in Berkeley. Right? Yeah. Hear me out. I, I know the area probably better than you do. And I don't mean to be negative that way, but hear me out. Yeah. Yes, you got a Kroger. Are you proud of that Kroger's? They should have bought where Farmer Jack was and built a Class A store. Not a store that 70% of it is bank and prescription and the rest you can't even get a shampoo. I go to that store. It's dirty. It's unkept. And that's the way it is. I mean, and as far as residential, you know, someone who's passing around flyers over here lives next to back of, of uh, Myers, and the only thing that she wants is take down the wooden fence and put up a concrete one. That's right. And, and these are the kinds of things that this petitioner is addressing, is, is how to protect residential. And, and I guess what I'm really getting out of the bottom line is that, that something has to happen to this in this vicinity, this, this area, so that it does not deteriorate anymore. And whatever it is, it can only go if council zones the land so that it can be used in a better use than what it is presently. And so, you know, I'll speak up, and it's not for Walmart, but I, I say the land has to be changed. Whatever you want to put it, if you want to make it all that's the ERO, whatever it is, it, it can't remain a closed down church and it can't be a, a deteriorating shopping center. I mean, something has to happen. And, and you talk about property values, those who have homes there, you, you want to see something deteriorate and, and ruin the value of your homes, that's what you'll see. And, and, and there's, no, there's no other reason to start improving our city and improving the areas where we live where our kids go to school, where our residents want to live peacefully, is safe and secure. And that's what we try to do here. And, and I just don't want to make Walmart the thing that I have to discuss tonight. I'm here on a zoning change. And whether Walmart buys this piece of property or it doesn't go through, that's their problem. But somehow all of us are part of that area. And all of us have to determine what we want to see there. And I'd rather you come forward and say, I don't want this. Tell me what would you like to see there? The church. And it, anyway, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to be interrupted again. But, you know, a church, we've got uh, 58 churches per square mile in the city now. It all comes off the taxes. And it is that the that opposed churches, but you know, the church is closed. We had St. Ives closed, we had St. Peter's closed, we had Dutch Scotus closed, we had all these churches, we had Transfiguration, they're paying the bills on this church, they can't afford to pay the bills any longer from the archdiocese. So what do you want them to do, close up too? I mean, I really don't know. I'd rather you, rather than fight me, tell me what would you like to see in that, in that particular area that would be a positive step for all of us concerned. And that's really what we have to decide. And I think by rezoning this property to something more useful than, than a shelter. And like I said, I remember I got married in that church and I in the old church where it is now a gymnasium. I've painted that building a hundred times. So it, that's how long it's been there and it's deteriorating so I'm embarrassed about it. Mr. Chairman, I just think that council has to go forward with some kind of change, and I don't care what you zone it, but you got to be three and funny up, and it's not whether you're for or against Walmart, but, you know, trying to hide behind traffic and, and this and that, that, you know, against Walmart, they want against Walmart. But, but that's not, that traffic is, is not a problem. And, if they, and I don't know anything if you put in the strip commercial that they're going to give you any amenities that are going to reduce traffic on South Pier Road. They're just going to go in and do their thing, and they won't have the money to do any improvements. But that's what you want. That's what you'll get. Um, thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Uh, and I, I agree with you that this is really
really about the zoning. However, in high profile projects like this, it's always impossible to set uh, or, or split zoning from right. the potential uh, use. So, right. Well, Mr. Chairman, that's when you're a statesman, that's when you're not. That's right. Miss <laughs> Lawrence, uh, Mayor Lawrence, uh, it's your turn. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think it's been an maximum question back tonight. Um, I, I, I want to, to piggyback on what uh, Councilor McCarthy has said. I have been a councilwoman and currently the mayor. And I've seen, I think it's a total of three projects come before us for that property. We had an amazing development that was awesome. It was residential, it was a strip mall, then we had one that was in housing, high rise. Um, but at the end of the day, because of the cost that we don't control, large diocese, they couldn't get the numbers to work. And they walked away from it. Um, no one is saying it, but it is a blighted site. Um, I don't know why the church hasn't been leveled and no one is using it. I know there's been a number of religious uh, institutions and churches that have tried to purchase that property and they have not seemed to be able to meet the cost or the price that the archdiocese has asked for that property, which is their right. We all know that the archdiocese consolidated uh, for whatever reason and, and, and reassigned re their uh, members to different churches throughout the country. But what we have before is a blighted site that, uh, frankly, I don't like to see in our city, and it's a very high problem. When we talk about traffic, we have a uh, number of people driving past that. We have before us an opportunity to rezone some property for development. And that appears to be the first step. And, and it was uh, it was read off the number of uses that can go into that site. The council holds the ultimate power. Nothing can get developed there unless the council approves it. And what we have before us and there was some good discussion about Walmart, but I too want to get back to the zone. It's time for us to, 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 to take the steps to move our city forward, and then we can have that discussion on what we want at that site. Every development that the archdiocese or someone on developer process requires rezoning. Even the residential, they wanted to put mixed use because that property uh, cannot sustain the profit at the cost of that property that the archdiocese is asking for, and we have no control over that. And I don't think we will have a developer that wants it to be residential. We can't even get the trailer park site, that construction site completed, as we know the developer walked away from it and it's still dirt open land and that development wasn't completed. Um, we all know the foreclosure crisis that we're having. I would love to see new construction. I just don't see that uh, happening in residential. But can we can we look at the have the vision for the city of what we can put there? And that's something that um, and so we we have to look at what's before us as the zoning. And, and know the power that the council has to have those discussions and this traffic and whatever it is. I'm hoping that if we get it resolved that we can actually demolish that building if no one's going to use it. And it doesn't sound like it's, uh, it hasn't happened in all these years. And so that we can at least level that area and start maintaining it so at least it's an open green spot instead of a uh, Light that it is, and I do want to say that, that that corner has a lot of traffic, and those of us who travel to other communities, there are places in Metro Detroit that there's a parking lot every day, and people choose to live there. Some move away because they want more greener, open space, but we are a urban, suburban.
suburban city. We are not an open green space. Should we mitigate our traffic? Absolutely. Should we listen to the concerns of our residents that live around us? Every single thing we build a bus to some type of residential. And you know, 7 Eleven, the Target, the Home Depot, um, the Golden Corral, every single development that comes to us on South Hill Road has packed these gallons. And we've had to make a decision. The council has. There's never going to be an easy development. We are an urban suburban area. We are an existing community. But we have to have the vision and the elected officials of how we can take care of our residents and take care of the vitality of this community. And that, that's not easy. It is not easy. But we're going to have to make those decisions. So I, I you know, always, um, and I don't do this to blow smoke up, up the skirts or the pan blades of the council people. You've asked some really good questions tonight, the questions you're supposed to ask. Because we are accountable to the people. And, you know, I, I, I use this example all the time. The 7 Eleven that was on Eastern 12 Mile packed this area. The Target packed this area. The Home Depot was um, just a huge fight. The Golden Corral, every single one of those caused us. You don't sleep well when you're elected official and you have these things. But you have to make the decision to um, what. What should we do to provide the services, the products, take care of our residents? But also, at the end of the day, we have to make a decision. Thank you. Um, I have uh, some questions that I'd like to ask. And, uh, first, I'd like to say that um, I, I agree with um, Councilman Fercasi that um, uh, and the, the reality is, uh, we have a very blighted site uh, that's not getting any better. Uh, and when you combine it with South Oak Commons to the north, um, uh, it's a concern. And, and I, uh, prior to um, Walmart's interest in this property, a number of people have contacted us to say, you know, what are you going to do about uh, about 12 miles south of them? And um, uh, you know, the, the frustrating thing for us is that uh, we're in a period of declining revenues. Uh, tax pro values are, uh, have shrunk. Uh, we have um, our budget meetings are, are very tense. As, um, we're trying, to, you know, we're committed to doing more with less. Um, and um, the uh, flip of the side of this is that we don't have people uh, beating down our doors. Um, to build here, um, you know we have a, we have a trickle of uh, projects. The latest ones have been Burger King and um, uh, Taco Bell, Wendy's. and and a Wendy's uh, and a Popeyes. You know, uh, we're not getting big name restaurants, uh, although it's not for lack of effort um, in trying to attract them. So there is there is that there's a very real story here with this. Um, and on the other side of it, uh, there is the community impact. And, uh, you know, honestly, I believe that. Um, uh, I have printed out a stack of emails that uh, I've received from residents, and I, I, I've acknowledged receiving them and said I, I appreciate your um, feedback, and sincerely I do. Um, a number of the things that I'm hearing from residents about uh, this proposal um, are, have also uh, been my concern. So in no particular order, um, uh, if we could have, a, a, and I'll skip the things that have already been mentioned in the interest of time, but um, uh, one of the recurring themes in a number of uh, the emails, uh, and it's a concern of mine because we've had uh, struggling businesses on South Hill Road for years, and empty stores in South Oak Commons in particular, um, what is the impact, uh, uh, when someone from the company would uh, speak to this, the impact on businesses uh, in the area? Uh, there's lots on the internet about how Walmart has destroyed downtown. So uh, if you could speak
speak to that. Um, and we need to be concerned about other businesses in the neighborhood, although generally as a rule of council says, you know, uh, it's at your own risk. However, uh, in these times, um, people walk away from buildings. And then we're stuck, uh, the number of uh, structures that this council has had to tear down mm -hmm. has escalated in the last couple of years. And that money is coming out of your pockets and our pockets coming out of our, what tax dollars we have. Mm -hmm. So it is a concern. Uh, will a superstore uh, cause uh, other businesses to become uh, <coughs> vacated and then perhaps, yeah. uh, worst case scenario, abandoned? Uh, can someone from the company yes, address that? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, to your, to your point, uh, particularly for this location, I'll, I'll use the abandoned restaurant that, that currently sits at the north end of the existing property and it's, it's, it's the way it exists today. I fully expect that should this project be approved that you will find the owner of that property scouring and probably have multiple offers from coming into them to put something into that abandoned what it will be, I can't tell you that. That's, that's not our development. It's not our property. What I can tell you is the feedback we've received from the immediate business owners of the gas stations who were, of course, relieved that we would not be supplying fuel on our property. So the gas stations don't have that competition. The, the Dunkin' Donuts owner just to the north is very excited about the project. The Comerica Bank across the street very excited about the project. And most of those folks do the same thing that our company has to do. They're on the laundry list with all of their respective brothers and sisters that operate establishments just like them across the country, whether it's Comerica Bank Manager who has other bank managers in the area. The vast majority of those businesses find themselves getting moved up the list when it comes to their capital improvement projects. And I fully expect that the bank manager of the Comerica Bank should this project be approved be going immediately to his superior saying, they're going to build this thing. We need capital improvements at our bank location in order to polish up our facility, whatever you want to say, in order for us to continue to draw more customers. What you what you hear on on the internet is Walmart comes to town and mom and pop gets closed down. And then they say that's true. And they don't look at the actual facts of the matter. And again, I will point to what happened in Florida yeah. specifically. We made a business decision as a company because we could not expand that existing Warren location to cover the needs of our customers. We chose to move up the road and build a new super center. And I can tell you that the mayor, the city of Warren, was not happy about the decision that we made. He made a lot statements in there publicly about Walmart. But he also didn't realize the circumstances of the situation that we did not own that property. So while we left the building, we maintained our lease obligation to the developer that owned the property, and that developer failed to maintain that property. And now that we're coming back, I can tell you that the restaurants in the, in the parking lot of the facility the other businesses that are still, there aren't many, there's like a, an old country buffet, and I believe it's, a, it's called GameStop. Those businesses cannot wait for us to start construction and get this project moving forward in more because they know that the customers they have lost since we left will be coming back. And again, I'm not going to ask you to take my word for it. That's my version of the story. I think your staff and your colleagues that are on other city councils in metropolitan Detroit, other mayors that work with Mayor Lawrence in metropolitan Detroit, will tell you very specifically what their impression of our company and our location are. And I would ask you all to take their word for it, not my word for it. Um, another, another thing from a uh, resident that was uh, what are your um, uh, procedures for uh, rodent uh, 
uh, and extermination control. And, and um, thanks for asking that, because that, that was one of the other items. Specifically rats, but... One of the other items, I know that it, it was curious to me on how it was brought up, but I think I understand now what, what the resident was referring to. Um, my understanding of, of the experience that was relayed to her was that it was either a restaurant or maybe even a, a separate grocery store that had kind of the, you know the old dumpster behind the building and at the end of the shift or whatever the restaurant or whoever it is just kind of takes the trash out to the dumpster and lifts the lid and throws it in and then the trash company comes and they hook the garbage truck up and throw the dumpster over the top and empty it. And because of that system that they utilize, they have problems with rodents. We don't have those problems at our locations. And the reasons we don't have those problems at our locations is spelled out in the site plan. We have separate trash that's inside the building and goes directly to our compactors that are completely enclosed and encased. So there's no Walmart employee that you know, I don't takes expiring uh, produce or, or, or meats and poultry and just puts them in a trash can and walks them out to a dumpster and throws them in and hopes that the, the lid closes. That's not how our system operates. Okay. Um, it's spelled out specifically in the site plan. And, and as I understand it, there are very specific requirements that the city has regarding that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier about security. I heard from many people about security, crime in the parking lots, that sort of thing. And you mentioned that you'd have cameras inside and out. Who would be monitoring those cameras? Well, we have staff that are, we have associates inside the stores. Mm -hmm. That's there. It would be a 24 or 7 or whatever your hours are monitoring. And so how cameras it, obviously would operate. How, how it works typically is, um, and, I, and I can, I'm happy to have other individuals. I'm sorry they couldn't be here tonight, but that was one of the one groups our asset protection, our, our regional manager for asset protection that was with us before the planning commission phase um, two evenings ago or two hearings ago. She was unable to join me tonight. Um, so what we have is if we have an incident inside the store, um, let's say a retail theft, shoplifting, whatever it might be, we have associates that will respond to that as soon as they see it. Or it's reporting. Um, detain the individual and immediately they call the local police department and then they, we go ahead and process the retail fraud claim. Um, if one of our associates sees an incident in the parking lot, we do the same thing. Um, we immediately call to the local jurisdiction and their police department to respond. But as I said, it depends on this location and the requirements, frankly, from the city on on whether we just have cameras in there that are monitored by our staff, or if we have a private security that monitors <laughs> the parking lot, or again, in the event with the planning commission's recommendation that we want to operate 24 hours, <coughs> we don't see then the need to patrol the parking lot if we're not operating 24 hours. We wouldn't see that need. Another question, um, what about gun sales? Would this proposed store be selling uh, firearms? I'm glad you brought that up because that was one of the, how do I say it? We thought that was a very positive comment from last week's uh, planning commission phase. Uh, I thought it was a very factual, legitimate concern that a neighborhood community might want us to address. And so I'm frankly trying to get an answer to that myself. Hmm. I do know that we do have stores that do not have firearms. I also know, particularly in the Upper Peninsula, we have not only firearm sales, but tactical firearm sales. And again, that demand is, as you can imagine, quite different in the Upper Peninsula, in rural and hunting-based communities, than it would be in this community. So 
if the store were limited to, say, eighteen dollars, I would not consider. I do have the authority standing before you tonight to tell you that that is not a deal breaker. We do have the request, respectfully, that should you choose that, that you very seriously consider the, the 365th day and that, that Black Friday eight hours, we would continue to be able to operate on that day alone during the 24 hours. Uh, that's already happening in Southfield. Uh, what, I, what I can't answer tonight is, um, and again, I have the authority to agree with the Planning Commission's recommendation. If this body chooses to go another route, to say, for example, say, all right, rather than 18 hours, we're considering 24-hour operation, but that 24-hour operation, in order to operate 24 hours, that will require you to hire a private security. I think I can get that approved, if that's your preference, but under the circumstances of 18 hours, with the feedback we've gotten from the residents, that you're getting from the residents, that everybody seems to agree, operating from 6 in the morning to midnight is enough. I have the authority to say that is not a deal breaker for us. Um, tell me about uh, who will own this property. There, uh, uh, somebody that was forwarded to me said that well, Walmart uh, gives their their store properties to the foundation, which are nonprofits, and then uh, lease the store leases them from the foundation, and they avoid yeah. paying taxes that way. That, um, I've not heard of that, but yet that. Uh, I've received that um, question from a number of people. Yeah, some of that probably goes back to, again, uh, internet sites that talk about it, and Tyler, please help me, their REITs, is that right? Which used to be utilized by not only Walmart, but lots of other entities when it came to how they managed their assets, and the REITs are no longer available as a venue. So for this particular location, Walmart will own the property. And pay taxes. And pay taxes. Okay. And with no incentives, I would remind you. Uh, another question, I, I, I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it because it was um, uh, asked of me. Um, well, uh, is Walmart seeking uh, from the city of Southfield uh, a tax subsidy or tax abatement? No, I, I just said that. So let, me, let me echo that statement. Uh, we are seeking, seeking we have not requested, we have no economic incentives. We have in no way, shape, or form approached the city staff, the mayor, any council member, any other individual here in the city of Southfield to request that you all as elected officials open up your economic toolbox to help incentivize us to build this store. We are not seeking them. We do not want them. We are not asking. We're expecting to be treated like any other taxpayer and pay the full rate. Could you tell me uh, what about deliveries to the store? What are the hours of delivery? Um, I don't I, mean, I, I don't I'm pleased with um, you know the design of, of um, the truck well and so on and, and the uh, buffer that you're putting up, but that. <coughs> That is a comment that we hear from uh, virtually every new uh, commercial development. Uh, noise, uh, uh, deliveries during early morning hours, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and that, that question has also come up in a number of our meetings with residents and, and through the Climate Commission phase. And I, I think today, once uh, the residents in particular, the vast majority have been satisfied with our response. So, Typically, a size of this location, a location of this size, 132,000 square feet, with as uh, as Robert mentioned, more of a flexed um, grocery component, um, you would probably see at this location two physical Walmart deliveries <coughs> each day, maybe limited to five or six days, again depending on volume. So by that I mean you will typically have a general merchandise truck that would arrive at the store 
not unusual, maybe again, preparing for the big holiday rush, that we might get one extra merchandise truck in, but the idea that you know, 52 semi-tractors are going to be driving in and out of that store on a daily basis is, we don't have any place to put it unless you all want to give us a waiver to keep trailers in the parking lot, which I'm assuming we don't. No. So, that's kind of the Walmart delivery. Now, in addition to Walmart deliveries that we have, you will also see a number of other suppliers that do deliver, whether it's the local beer and wine distributor, uh, the Pepsi guy, the Coke girl, the bread truck, and those deliveries will also come through through the course of the day. Most of those will operate off the existing schedule that that particular entity has in supplying not only us, but I'm going to use a simplistic example. The Coke guy might get Target up the road and then come down and hit us after he gets done with that delivery, for example. The bread truck's probably going to be there early in the morning. Um, but again, our associates are in the physical building during the late night hours, so we don't have those kinds of deliveries. And all of those deliveries are located in the back of the building, in the loading dock, and through the, the entrances off the back of the building. Again, for those suppliers that like Coke or Pepsi or, or milk or whatever it might be that come in at those off hours. There's no real set time for each individual store, but those are things that we can talk about because some locations do have limitations on delivery um, and some locations do not. It really just depends on, on what the counts are. So, so your answer um, uh, is informative, but to get to the point, basically, um, uh, you haven't told me the hours of delivery. Walmart truck deliveries, again, typically arrive in the early afternoon hours. Yeah, so that's what I heard, but I didn't read you said there are other people that... Uh, the other deliveries come through as we work with our suppliers based on their existing schedule. And they can be restricted? And they, well, and they can be restructured. Re, re, reconfigured, frankly. I mean, okay. we, could, we could certainly go to beer and wine wholesaler and say, we're sorry, but you can't make us the last run of the evening and delivering beer and wine at 10 o'clock at night. You've got to move us up in the schedule to make sure that our delivery comes with the approach. Those are things that we as a company can do with those that supply our customers. Um, and a final question, uh, and you've more or less addressed this, but uh, there have been a number of people who point to Northland and think that uh, Walmart might benefit that shopping center. And then they further point to the, J the long vacant J.C. Penney store, with, which is what they, or is a, a huge facility uh, with three levels. Um, was any thought given to J.C. J. C. Penney's or Northland itself? I'll turn it back over to Mr. Angle. Thank you. Um, actually, I was going to ask Terry if you might mention some of the development hindrances of the Northland Mall site. There's power plants under it, there's multiple levels. Uh, Walmart doesn't have three story operations. The setbacks, the air rights. Um, uh, Terry, you eloquently addressed this at planning commission meeting better than we've even explored it. I'll just talk in general terms, but um, please. Not unlike many homeowners, the mall is upside down on their mortgage just like many people are. I don't know the exact figures. Um, but they can't get a loan to make improvements at that site until they pay off their existing loan, which is probably twice of what it's worth right now. As you know, the shopping center was built in the early 50s, 54. Uh, it has its own physical plant to generate electricity and heat and so forth underground, and that, that infrastructure in itself is 60 plus years old. Um, it was developed at a time before the city even came to an existence, and so there's some odd parcels and islands within those lots that don't have access to the road, don't have cross access or easements to parking lots. The old Montgomery Wards is a perfect example where the lot is about one or two feet wider than the building itself. And we've had a lot of um, proposals for that site that can't be developed. We 
because um, they can't get access parking or whatever. Uh, there, there are some of the large anchor tenants, the former J.C. Pennies, who are still owned by the parent company and have mothballed it on purpose to prevent competitors from coming in. And many of those anchor tenants actually own air rights all the way out to the road that prohibit any out parcel development from happening. Now, as you know, Target was recently built there, and that building itself provides challenges because it doesn't have a separate um, separate parcel. In order for taxes and so forth, it has to be physically separated from the building to collect a separate tax. But because of building code and fire issues, um, fire wall separation would have to be put in place. And I could go on and on about some of the challenges. And then ultimately, the property is owned by a conglomerate of businesses outside of the state that control what can go in there and what can't go in there. So, regardless of this project, I, I know um, Ms. Freeman, Mr. Aceves, and myself sat in a number of discussions on how to improve Northland Mall. And unfortunately, there's just so many different challenges there, it just almost makes it impossible to get new development. All right, I'll, uh, I'm sure you could um, tell us a lot more about that, but I, I, the answer simply is um, it's, not gonna, it's not workable. All right, at this point, is it Penny's separate facility than the mall? Um, because I do know of a business that was looking to purchase Penny's, which is an independent building, and they're totally independent from the mall. Just through the chair, based on what my understanding is, they're physically attached to the mall. Uh, there had to be a, a firewall or something kind of separately closed off. It, it is a, maybe a separate entity. But it's it's attached to the mall, and that's yeah. part of part of the concerns because of it's still owned by a separate entity. That that piece of it, but it's physically attached to the mall, and I, I believe there's a firewall separation that had to be put up to block people off from the mall to entering that space. That's all I know from sitting in on meetings. I know Mr. Cumberford could probably give you more specifics on that. All right. Um, it's now uh, going on 11 o'clock. Uh, are there any other questions from council for the mayor? Um, I want to say that uh, to the uh, representatives from Walmart that uh, we appreciate your being here. Um, I think you've given us a lot of information and things that we did not have. Um, I learned, personally speaking, I learned an awful lot tonight uh, about this proposal. And uh, to our planner, I thank you for um, uh, bringing this uh, to us this evening. Um, and again, we uh, to the audience, I thank you very much for being civil and listening. This is very important that council have these four hours uh, to hear this, so that as we hear from you, uh, we can um, uh, respond to some of your concerns, but also. Uh, dig deeper, if need be, um, on uh, this uh, proposal. So, uh, with that, um, I invite there, Mr. Crow. I just, I just want to ask the council, just so I'm clear, because when we scoped this out, we had some tentative dates scheduled for January, right. and I want to just make sure there's enough comfort level in between December 3rd and January 14th that Walmart is able to respond to some of the open questions that the council may have, that we can prepare our packages, get the information from the planning commission to the council, schedule a site plan review committee, and then possibly schedule that reserve date of January 28th for public hearing. In order for that to happen, um, public hearing notices and some other things will have to be done early in January prior to our next council meeting. So I just want to make sure that the council is comfortable between now and the 14th to gather the additional information and, and to continue on this tentative schedule that we have. Uh, I, have a, I have a question based on something that Mr. Lance said. Um, it was not my understanding of that this is going to go to, uh, proposal is going to go to council site plan as uh, it was going to go to the entire council uh, on January 14th. Well, 
Um, remember, there's two pieces to this. There's the rezoning. Right. That's the most important piece. That would not go to council site plan committee. Right. But then there's the site plan review committee yeah. that typically the council likes to have at least a recommendation from prior to. Now, the result we can bring the rezoning back on the 14th and then deal with the site plan issues after that, or we could try to have a preliminary meeting on the site plan issues so that when we have a full workout with the council, we can tackle both the rezoning and the site plan at the same time. And so I, I defer to what your comfort level and scheduling. I just need to know in advance for the public hearing notices. Well, very clearly, we want the community to know when the public hearing uh, will be held. Right. And um, what I'm hearing is January 28th. Okay. Uh, and we will work to clear that agenda of other items so that it is the principal um, uh, item on the agenda that you right. uh, We've already started to move some things that tentatively were on the 28th. Uh, would you uh, enlighten us as to what you see happening on the 14th of January? Well, um, through the chair, um, this was just an open presentation with some initial questions. Right. We would like the planning department would like to have the opportunity to make our presentation on our investigation and recommendations from the planning commission. So we would like that opportunity where we prepare our packets, our findings, and so forth to the council, have a workout based on the issues that were raised at the planning commission level, have the planning department respond to any of your questions, deal with the rezoning itself on its own merits, and then um, any site plan issues that you have on the 14th before you hold your official public hearing and make any final decisions on the 28th. Uh, to be clear, there will be no vote on the 14th. It will just be further, further discussion with the budget of the planning department. Uh, and once again, to the audience, um, if you want to speak on December 10th, uh, you contact the clerk's office by Wednesday uh, at noon, correct, Ms. Banks? And um, if you want to speak on the 14th before the Wednesday proceeding on the 14th, um, uh, and so, uh, for the 28th, you do not need to, if, if it's during the public hearing, you, you will be recognized by the chair, uh, and you may speak then. Will communications be first? Uh, once again, if uh, you want to leave them, uh, uh, you're not going to use email and want to uh, write a comment, comment cards are in the front of the room. Um, Otherwise, uh, I think we're concluded for the evening with Mr. Charette. I just have a quick uh, question of clarification. I'm concerned with follow-up on uh, Councilman Frazier's question on the OCRC uh, and the uh, light sequencing. Uh, could I work with uh, Mr. Crowd on that? Absolutely. We can get a, we can get a representative and here. And if you're not able to get that by the 10th, um, then certainly by the 14th of January. Uh, is that okay, Mr. Fraser? Absolutely. All right. And then we had the follow up on gun sales, and I take it that Mr. Crow will follow up on that? Or that that's correct. We'll um, work with the representatives to get those answers prior to the 14th. Thank you. All right. Mr. Chairman? Yes. The County Road Commission is meeting at our library on the camp visit. I forgot to try to You have a meeting this week and that's you know, I did just talk about day. all the roads in Oakland County, but specifically looking at the doors out to the On the fifth. On the fifth. Uh, well we'll leave it with uh, the planner and the city administrator to uh, provide that information. Uh, if there are no other items to come before council then